Hello. Oh, good morning, everybody. I don't know if you, if you can hear me. Hello, PK. Yeah. How are you? Yeah, good morning. I'm fine. That's great to see you. Yeah, thank you. I see Gonzalo. Hello, hello, Gonzalo. I don't know if you can hear me. And Alex, hi. Hello, morning. Morning. Hello, Gonzalo. <laughs> Hello, nice. Alexander. How are you? How are you? Oh, nice. <laughs> yes, nice to see you guys. I mean, we are in different time zones, right? So, <laughs> PK, what time is it there locally? Uh, about, about midday, right? Hello, okay. yeah. midday. Well. It, it is 1 p.m. Oh, 1 p.m., right. Okay, yeah. okay. So, uh huh. Minwong, Minwong, and uh, you're in China now, right? Yeah, yeah, I'm in yeah. China. What time? What time is it there in Beijing? Uh, it's 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 three twenty four p.m. p.m. Oh my goodness! So, <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, tomorrow's worse. Tomorrow, tomorrow's worse because tomorrow we start at half past five locally Lisbon time. It's uh, six, well, six a.m. Madrid time, Spain time, and also C uh, C E S T. And uh, so in uh, Alex, so New Zealand, what time is it there? About about six, right? Seven twenty-four. Seven twenty-four. Seven twenty-four. Hello. Seven twenty-four. Hello, hi, Rob. Right. So tomorrow we have speakers from all over the world, from the east to west. I mean, like today as well. Uh, but it's going to be uh, more difficult because we have people speaking at about one in the morning lo uh, locally. We have people speaking at about seven, eight. So it's going to be um, a quite, quite unique experience. <laughs> uh, hello, Matt. Good morning. Good morning. Should, well, good afternoon. Good evening. Should I say exactly? Good evening. <laughs> Nice to see you. <laughs> as you know, as you, you see, we, we're in the Marcel Grossman spirit. We have the Marcel Grossman t-shirts. Uh, Diego okay. also. <laughs> so it's- How much, uh, Francisco? Sorry, sorry? How much do they cost? <laughs> uh, well, you paid, you, well, you almost, almost 200 euro. I mean, sorry, sorry, 500 oh. euros because that was the, the fee for, for, <laughs> for last time. So it's very expensive. Uh, unfortunately, we had, yeah, I mean, unfortunately, I mean, uh, I, I don't know if the tech support are, are here. I don't know if, if I should say this, but I will say it anyway, because uh, the, the, the fees are very expensive. And we had quite a, quite a, a, a large number of uh, people who didn't uh, want to participate uh, in principle due to the large fees, because it's an online meeting, you know? And uh, so unfortunately it's, uh, but anyway, anyway, so it's, it's great to see you guys. Sung Wong, how are you? Good morning. Or should I say good morning, uh, good afternoon, right? South Korea ah. now should be at about, ah. what time is it there? What time, what time is, is uh, in oh, Seoul? Evening. Yeah, uh, uh, four o'clock uh, afternoon. Four o'clock, four o'clock, okay. <laughs> okay, and we also have here, uh, Zhuang Wish from uh, Tatsu. So good morning, Zhuang Wish. Hi. Hi. Okay, so um, 8.26, maybe it's, it's best to start because uh, we have to uh, try, um, try to be sharp on the, on, on the schedule. Uh, unfortunately, I was, I was told that uh, the uh, session will be um, disabled about uh, 10 minutes, a quarter of an hour after the session ends, which is about 9.30 uh, Central European time. So we should try to keep on schedule. Uh, we had quite a large number of uh, participants. I did think about having uh, three blocks, but, th but then that's too much, you know? I mean, I think that, that's, uh, well, two blocks in two days is, uh, is enough for, for, for these sessions. And, uh, and unfortunately, we had to compact the talks to 15 minutes, um, 10 minutes, some, some talks. And uh, I did give quite a lot of importance uh, for the second block tomorrow for the mini session on, on the warp drive which we'll, we, uh, I think will be quite, quite uh, exciting, in fact, you know. So, uh, so, <laughs> so the talks uh, were allocated a bit more time than, than average. So there's 20 minutes talk, there's a uh, half an hour talk. And um, so that should be quite, quite nice to, to, to hear. Um, quite, quite a few number of, of participants uh, did want to participate, but refused to pay the fee. 
So that was a, quite unfortunate uh, also. And um, so um, two words only on the, on the schedule. So um, after we start at 8.30, so Min Wong will, will share his screen. I will just um, allow for all the participants to share the screen. Um, I've got some, some talks. If there's, uh, well, um, Min Wong, don't, um, don't share it yet. I will, I, will, I will tell you. So, I mean, uh, <clears throat> Just to just as a, a precaution, I did uh, ask um, for you to send us your talks if there's a weak connection, so we don't waste too much time, so we can share the the screen. Uh, but I think that's uh, it should be fine. Um, so uh, after after the, the speaker starts, I will I will please ask you to to mute your your microphone so there's no interference um, audibly. Um, and um, um, and when, um, so it's, so uh, today each talk will be 15 minutes. Uh, the chairperson, I will chair the first six talks. Diego will then chair the uh, second half, which is the, um, uh, the last um, six talks. We will uh, inform the speaker at about 10 minutes that he has about, th uh, well, three minutes to go, okay? So tentatively, it's, um, it's, it should be about 12 minutes talk and three minutes uh, questions, okay? So um, I, will, I will please ask you to, to please be on time, okay? So we don't have uh, too much, too many delays. And without further ado, it's almost 8.30. Um, I will then ask uh, Minwa to share his screen. And uh, thank you all for your, your presence, your participation. And I'm sure that this will be a, a very exciting uh, session as, as it was last time around. The last two sessions, the last two muscle harassments were, were quite exciting. Okay, meanwhile, so um, please go ahead. Okay. And um, so, meanwhile, uh, we'll be speaking about shadows and photon rings of asymmetric thin shell wormholes. Okay, so Min Wong, when you want to start, please go ahead. Min Wong, can you hear me? Min Wong? Min Wong, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, but but can you hear me? Yeah, well, no, yes, now I can. So please start when you when you can, okay? Uh, I think that, that you really shared your your, uh, your screen. So just share your presentation so we can start. Okay, can you see my slide? Well, we can see the okay, right now, okay. now we see it. Now we see it, okay. So okay. Right. So maybe, I will maybe I will... maybe my mic net is not working well. <laughs> okay. So please please go ahead, okay? Thank you. Okay. Uh, if you see me, uh, I'll, I'll continue. Yes, okay. yes. We can see okay. you and we can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Good. 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 Uh, good afternoon. <laughs> oh no, no. Good. Good. Uh, good morning. I'm uh, happy to give a talk uh, as as a 16th muscle grassman meeting. Uh, my 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 title of my talk is the shadows and photon rings of a symmetric shell wormhole. My 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 talk uh, is uh, my talk in composed of of uh, three parts. The first part is what is a shadow. Okay, let's start. Let's start from from the from some examples uh, in our real, real world. Uh, as we know, shadow is a dark area which is formed by by that a non-transparent object in prison. The transmit of light is is kind of optical phenomenon. Uh, see the see see the figures. Uh, 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 people's people people's hands people hands block their lines so uh, on the screen uh, they 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 form uh, some uh, the, the shadows no here uh, gravity is ignores is ignored. Uh, okay let's turn to the curved space line we know that light light bends when it pass near a strong gravitational field which is one of the important predictions of uh, general relativity uh, uh, which is known as the gravitational lens e effect, uh, uh, and uh, mo moreover, what what happens when the gravitational field is extremely strong? Uh, we know that near the horizon, near the horizon, the gravitational 
and near, near the horizon of black holes. The 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 gravitational the gravity the gravity is very strong. It's it's so uh, the gravity is so strong that some photons uh, will never will never is, is escape to the infinity of fall fall in the black holes. They uh, actually they they move they move in uh, a circular photon orbits. Uh, all the all the circular photon orbits form a photon sphere, form a photon sphere and. The, the the photons on uh, in, uh on the photon sphere are put bit are put bit they can go they can they can escape to the uh, infinity or fall fall into the black holes uh, as, as we know as we know the the Wang, I think we lost you. Min Wang? Yeah. Your screen is frozen. I don't know if you can hear me. Min Wang? In one. <clears throat> uh, in one, if you can hear me, uh, maybe it's best for you to to leave and then come back on. Minwong, can you hear me? Minwong? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, okay. Can you hear me? Please, please continue. Okay, thank you. Oh, I, I, I think in my office, the, 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 the net is not, not good. Okay. It, it, can you hear me now? Yes, yes, yes. Please go ahead. Okay, okay. Let's continue. Okay, let's continue. As, as we know, as we know, the, the light, the light in the in the space time, in the space time is cur is curved. But but our 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 eyes believe the light, the the, the light tra travel travel in straight lines. So so the the, the so called black hole shadow is is larger than the photon sphere. Okay. But uh, now uh, let's, I will show how to how to characterize the different kinds of non-geodesic and the size of the shadow. Let, let's take the Schwarzschild black hole as an example. Uh, from the metric and the conserved quantities, quantities we can we can finally get get the the radio the radio equation uh, the radio uh, the radio equation of, of of the photons. As we know, the the affine uh, parameter. Uh, can be re parameterized. Uh, thus, the the energy the energy is, is not an in, in the independent variable. So we can define we can define a compact parameter b equals l over e. Okay, different different b uh, give if uh, can 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 describe different tra trajectories of of lights. Let's let's see the effective uh, potential. Uh, uh, here we can we can see that uh, for different impact perimeters, uh, the the uh, the if the effect the effective potential have different shapes. Uh, uh, for 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 B is larger than B C. We can see that under uh, from from R S to R L. We see the region is is is, is negative. Sorry. Sorry. 
You know, please continue. Please continue. Okay, I, I, I'm not sure. I, can, can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. We can hear you. Okay, 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 <clears throat> okay. When when R is is larger than R S and smaller than R L, we can see that the effective potential is negative. So this this region is forbidden. Uh, uh, and the uh, and for for B is smaller than B C, we can see that the effective potential is always positive. So all the lines are are allowed to live in this region. So uh, so the critical the critical impact. Uh, will will be that like will be like this. Uh, that is, uh, that is VR equals zero and the extreme of VR equal, equals zero. So we can get this condition. VR equals equals zero and V dot uh, V prime of, of the, is a table here. And finally, we can get we can get a, the critical parameter BC equals uh, three times square root three. Okay, okay. Thus, we can finally we can we can then to calculate the angular size of angular size of the uh, escape cone, escape cone. Okay, let let let's move to a thin shell thin shell wormhole. Uh, 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 the uh, 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 the thin shell wormhole uh, can can be uh, can be can be glued by uh, 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 we, we, we can use two distinct space times uh, glued by glued uh, glued by a seashell which forms a new manifold the external matter dis, discre, discre, uh, distributes in the seashell we can see that the ue is the is the, is the, uh, is the uh, full ve velocity of, of the shell and the na is the is the is uh, and the na is the is a vector is a vector on the on the uh, on the space like hypersurface hypersurface we can consider the two max uh, uh, the, the two max uh, in in the in the two two sides uh, they they both they they both takes in schwarzschild uh, schwarzschild metric uh, but but with different uh, parameters uh, mass parameters m uh, that that's uh, the 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 uh, the the both sides uh, the both sides share share a same a same velocity of the thin shell that is the u a then we can we can use we can we can we can we can use the normalization of u a to find the, the 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 equation the equation involved t dot in both sides next Next, uh, we uh, we can use we can use the normal vector of the hypersurface uh, of the hypersurface on the both on the on the both sides, and then we put U A and N A in a in a big in a big matrix, and the gamma it, it takes in this form. Then, Minwang, I think we lost you again. Minwang, I think we lost you. Uh, can you hear me? Minwang, can you hear me? Um, as we have only a few minutes left, uh, can I please ask you to, to just give the, um, the results? I don't know if you can hear me. Minwang, can you hear me? Minwang, 
We can't seem to hear you. Meanwhile, can you hear me? Hello? Hello, Minwang, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can okay. hear you. Please, I, please. I, can you. Can you help me to show my slides? I think I think my nap is... Um, well, is we, we, we have only about one minute left. So uh, can I please ask you just to uh, present the, the, the last couple of uh, slides, the, your main results, okay? The main results? Yeah. And then, okay? Yes, yes. Sorry yes. about this. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. So you have about one yeah, minute left, this, okay? To show yeah, 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 yes, yes, yes. This slide is, is our final result. We found there there's additional additional photon ring for a sim a symmetric uh, wormhole compared to black holes. So, hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes, sure, sure. Yeah. Okay. 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 I, I I think I think I, I'm not sure my my net is 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 working well. So could you help me to show my slide? If, um, if, if my net is, is right. Is, so if, if your I'm second lost. slide, your second your last slide is the your okay. Right there you are. Model yeah. two. So model yeah. So yeah. if you go to model two, right. So if you want to just say a few words about uh, model two. Yeah, yes, yes. Yes, the model two is, is the model two said that we have we have we also have addition, addition, additional photon rings for a symmetric a symmetric uh, uh, wormholes compared to a social black holes. The reason is the reason come from come from uh, the the lights can can go go through the thin shell to the other the other um, space time and go and turn and turn back to our uh, to our uh, uh, original space time. Yeah. Okay. Minwang, uh, so thank you very much. Um, I won't, uh, maybe maybe it's best not to have questions. If if, if anybody wants to ask Minwang um, a question, please do so in the chat. There are these uh, the, the so-called uh, break rooms, but if you want to just uh, just uh, ask um, questions to, to all, all, and I, I'm sure that uh, Min Wang will be uh, well, very happy to to answer the questions in the chat. Uh, maybe okay. it's best to part. Uh, okay, Min Wang, thank you okay. very much. Okay. Yeah, thank you. It's thank pretty you. about about the bad connection because because the the models are are, are very interesting, and the paper is very nice for these these ob uh, observational. Um, signatures, right, of these of these wormholes with, with, with the uh, shadows and the and the rings. But anyway, so thank you very much, Ming Wong. Okay, all right. So uh, let's pass on to the next speaker, which is uh, Silvia Pietroni. She's the, uh, hey. I think she's Jerry. Yes. Good hello, morning. Sylvia. Good morning. Hello. So please, hello. So please share your screen and uh, and please go okay. ahead. I will I will uh, inform you orally when you when there's about two minutes left. Uh, well, three minutes more or less. Okay, two minutes. Thank you very much. Can you see my screen? Yes, yes, we can. Okay. I will talk about the gravitational lensing by wormholes in binary systems. Maybe there is a problem in the... Okay. We know that uh, Alice wormhole can cause its light deflection, even if at zero mass. And for this reason, uh, lensing by wormholes has been explored by many, many authors during these years. And it was also recently investigated as a, um, a proof of uh, presence of exotic matter. Um, one effect has been found and is a uh, magnification effect that is a distinctive signature of the existence of Can you hear me? Hello? Can you hear me? There is some background noise. Yeah, Silvia, we can hear you. Okay. There was some okay. microphone on, but there's um, 
Okay, so this uh, demagnification effect is a um, signature of wormholes and is not present in lensing by ordinary matter. Uh, in uh, 2013, Kitamura et al. investigated uh, metric, uh, matrix falling as a one over R to the N. They found out that the fraction angle falls down as a one to the uh, U to the N, where U is the impact parameter. These results are given for uh, M greater than one. And in this case, there is uh, uh, the presence of the demagnification effect of the lens images. And this effect may be evidence of the Ellis model. In 2015, Bots and Postillone also studied investigating metrics falling as a one over R to the N. They proved that uh, the range of N between zero and one may describe galactic halos. And in the case of n greater than one, uh, there is a signature violation of the weak energy condition, uh, and this could be the existence of exotic matter. We remind also that n equal to two corresponds to the Ellis formal, and that n is the ratio between the tangential and the radial pressure. Now, um, here there is the, the lens equation. So we are talking about a binary system that is composed by two lenses, here we call it A and B. Uh, here is the lens equation where beta is the source position, theta is the angular position at which we see the image. And uh, there is the introduction of a new parameter that is gamma. Gamma is called the strength ratio and is the ratio between the two Einstein rings of the, um, sorry, the two Einstein radius of the two lenses. And uh, uh, through the lens equations, we are able uh, to find out the images of the source. The number of images of the source depends on the source position. So these regions um, are delimited by uh, caustics. Um, now I will, I'm going to explain what are critical curves and caustics. So starting from the lens equations that we saw before, uh, we are going to calculate the Jacobian determinant of the lens map. The condition j equal to zero defines the critical curves on the lens plane. Then applying the lens map on critical points, so we find um, the corresponding points on the source plane, and these points on the source planes uh, form the, the caustics. Um, caustics are important because when a source crosses a caustic, there is a creation of a new pair of images. In uh, my paper, I investigated three cases, the equal strength binary, the unequal strength binary and the reverse unequal strength binary. Uh, these three cases uh, um, are defined by the value of the parameter gamma. So um, in the equal strength binary, gamma is equal to one, and that means that the, that the two lenses have the same Einstein uh, radius. The unequal strength binary um, means that one lens is uh, bigger than the other one, and the bigger lens is the standard one. By standard lens, uh, we mean uh, um, that is an object described by the Schwarzschild matrix, and um, the corresponding index n is equal to one. The reverse and equal strength binary um, has the same gamma, but in this case, uh, the standard lens is the smaller one. In the, this presentation, I'm going to show only the results for the equal strength binary, and uh, the complete atlas uh, is in the paper. Um, that have done together with Bots and Melchiorre. So, uh, in the standard binary Schwarzschild lens, in the equal string case, um, we have three topology, three topologies. Uh, the first one is the closed separation, then the intermediate separation, and the wide separation. Mm, the separation uh, is the distance between the two lenses. And uh, these topologies are delimited by two values of the two transition. The first transition is the one between the closed and intermediate uh, separation, and the second transition is from the intermediate to the wide separation. And these are the values of the transitions um, in our units and in our paper. This is an example of standard binary lenses, and by standard, we mean um, a symmetric system in which the two lenses, the two objects, are uh, both described by the Schwarzschild metric. So they both have the same index, m equal to n equal to 1. Uh, in the upper panel, we can see the critical curves uh, in the three cases. So on the, le on the left, there is the small uh, the close separation, in the middle, the intermediate separation, and on the right side, we have the wide separation. And below, there are the corresponding caustics. So 
this is an example of standard binary lenses. In 2016, Bots and Melchior also investigated symmetric binary lenses, not only in the case uh, in which the two objects are um, swatched objects, but in the general case in which um, N has a range from zero to three. Uh, symmetric because both lenses have the same index. And they find out in the range of N greater than two, uh, so for exotic matter, the existence of giant acoustics. Uh, these blue ones are two giant caustics. So this is only one example of their uh, work. And um, here are my results. Uh, these are critical curves and caustics in the wide separation. I would like to remind that the red curve is the standard uh, Swartzschild case for n equal to, to one n, so the same index for the two lenses. Uh, we keep fixed in all the presentation the, um, the index of the first lens, so n equal to one fixed for the first lens, and we vary the second uh, the index for the second lens. And we can see that for small values of m, uh, there is a distortion, distortion in the critical curves. And um, we don't have this distortion for uh, greater values of m uh, because the first lens feels a weaker tidal field from the second lens. Um, we remind that m equal to zero is the singular isothermal sphere that was already investigated by Shin and Evans. With m uh, equal to 0 0.5, we um, can have a galactic halo. m equal to two is the Alice wormhole, and uh, for m equal to three, we could have an example of exotic matter. About the corresponding caustics, um, we have uh, for the first lens that the caustic are becoming smaller for greater values than M and are becoming greater for smaller values of M. They are moving in the, in the right direction. This is in the white separation. Let's see what happens if uh, we uh, put the um, two lenses closer. So, um, in, for the critical curves, we have bigger uh, critical curves in the case uh, um, of decreasing uh, in index M. And on the other side, we have uh, a domination of uh, the Stiebert profiles with uh, uh, greater M. Then uh, what happens in the close uh, separation if we put um, the two lenses uh, closer? Um, we have the appearance of uh, secondary uh, critical curves. So we have primary critical curves that are the biggest uh, one. And then we have uh, um, smaller critical curves with this kind of behavior. They are moving uh, towards the first lens as M increases. And uh, there is a um, particular case for M equal to zero in which the two critical uh, curves, um, there is a convergence of the two critical curves on the second lens. Um, so in this point, uh, there is an indetermination and the two corresponding caustics remains open on a, on a circle that is called the pseudo caustic. So only in the close separation, only for the, the value m equal to zero, we have uh, the presence of a pseudo caustic. Silvia, two minutes, please. Two minutes, oh, sorry, okay. There is also um, another strange behavior that is called the elliptic umbilic catastrophe, only in the range between zero and one. Uh, we also find out the values of the boundaries for the, the two transitions. The transition from uh, close to intermediate is given only numerically, while the transition from the intermediate to the white separation is given analytically. And this, uh, this is the, the plot of the separation values uh, as a function of gamma. Um, we did some analytical uh, approximation. I just want to show um, the yeah, extremely unequal strength ratio limit. That is one uh, of the two lenses is much smaller than the other one. And in the case of the Swatchit object, uh, this is called the planetary limit. In this case, in the caustic of the perturbing object, in the wide case, we have an extension of the caustic in the, in the vertical and the parallel directions. And this is an example of a planetary caustics. And this is the, the extension in the parallel direction. And this is the extension in the vertical direction. 
Uh, finally, my conclusion is that these kind of simulations are important uh, in the searching for uh, wormholes um, in the case in which uh, they appear in non-isolated systems. Um, so uh, this kind of simulation can also be used in the investigation of pairs of galaxies with different halos, uh, in the case of the value of uh, the index Nm uh, less than one, or also in the case in one object is uh, made by exotic matter and the other one is a swatchy object, as well, for example. And um, thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Silvia, for being on time and for a very nice talk. Uh, we have time for, for the questions. So if there's questions, um, please raise your hand. Um, any questions? Uh, Sylvia, just remind me, please, what is the Schwarzschild uh, um, solution? What are all the values for the N and the M for the Schwarzschild? The Schwarzschild is N equal to 1. Yes, and M is equal to? Um, N and M both equal to 1. Oh, both, both. OK, all this right. Is, okay. Mm -hmm. So this yeah, is oh, the standard. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Uh -huh. All right, so they, they are distinct signatures. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Right. Um, so we can see the signature of uh, yes, yeah, exactly. In the, case, in the case I'm equal to two, so is the yellow curve. So uh, we can see how it behaves with respect to the standard case. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so thank you, thank you very much for the very nice mm -hmm. talk, Sylvia. And we can pass on now to the next talk, which is given, which will be given by uh, Merce Guerrero. Yes. So, hello, Merce. So, hello. please, please share your, your screen and uh, please go ahead. Um, so, Merce will um, we'll, we'll be speaking about uh, double photon ring of asymmetric central wormholes in the Palatini F of R gravity. So, Merce, please go ahead. Oh, I have a problem. Yeah. You can share your screen, right? Uh, yeah, the thing is that uh, it makes me to get out and enter again. So in one second, I come back. OK. Just to say that it's, um, it's well, well, merci. Okay, merci. So please go ahead if you can share the screen now. Yeah. Okay, there we are. Okay. okay. You can see it. So, yes, sure, sure. So please go ahead. Thank you. And now you can see the change of slide. Yes, yes. <clears throat> so, good morning or good afternoon to everyone. Uh, today, I would like to present my work with collaboration with Gonzalo Olmo and Diego Rubiero. And it's called Double Photon Rings of Asymmetric potential workforce in part in F of R gravity. The motivation to do this work was basically when uh, there was, it was published this uh, M87 picture, there were a lot of uh, papers uh, related with this photon or these shadows of the black holes. And usually these um, words had um, some quantitative a small difference with respect to general relativity or black holes or when we were studying different black hole mimickers. So the difference between GR or beyond GR were very different, uh, were very small. And what we thought is to look for qualitative new predictions of these compact objects beyond general relativity. And what we, thought to do was basically to construct an asymmetric tension workhole that can lead to two photon spheres in one side of the uh, one hole throat and that it is stable under linear perturbations and it's held by positive matter stores. So um, to, in order to build this type of wormholes, we have two main that we basically match in one um, 
hypersurface. And the conditions needed to uh, match these two main faults are um, from the junction condition formalism. And here, these four equations are the junction, formal, uh, junction conditions found in the f of r gravity and the ones that we have used. So for example, the first one is that the metric has to be continuous through the um, hypersurface. The second one is related with the stress energy tensor. The first one is that the difference is brackets means the difference across the um, wormhole throat or the hypersurface. So the trace of the stress energy tensor of each side of the um, one whole throat has to be zero, and also the stress energy tensor of the shell has to be traceless. We also have this relation number three, which relates really the second fundamental form with the um, energy density of the um, um, stress energy tensor of the thin shell or living in the thin shell. And since it has to be traceless, we thought that we, well, we assumed that there was a um, perfect fluid. And due to this condition, basically, we have that the pressure and the energy density have to be proportional one to the other. And finally, with the rest of junction conditions, we have this relation between the radius and the energy density. If you want more details here, there's a um, well, it cannot be seen, but there's a paper of Gonzalo and Diego about the junction conditions in F of R gravity. So let's start with our work first. Since we have this first condition here, if we assume two razor nostrum on each side of the manifold, basically this relation constrains us because both masses have to be the same. So in order to have an asymmetric wormhole, the simple case is to start with an asparagus space term and match it with a razor nostrum. So from one of the previous um, tension condition, this is the one of the second form, gamma is a new constant that it depends on the gravitational constant, the um, energy density, etc. So when gamma Gamma, it's positive, we have um, energy, positive energy densities. These second fundamental forms have uh, inside the second derivative of the proper time of the um, radius. And we assume that there is an equilibrium um, point, R sub zero. And basically, what we do is expand this equation number five in power of zero around the equilibrium radius. Since we have a lot of parameters, what we decided to do is basically um, define new dimensionless um, variables by dividing by this mass of the main four and minus. And also, since we have this condition that the metric has to be continuous through the wormhole throat or the thin shell, we have this equation number 10, which um, takes out one of these um, three parameters that we have here. And here, what we have depicted is basically the parameter space of having um, a configuration stable under linear perturbations and configurations that have positive energy densities. And as you can see here, there's no overlap. So it's not possible to have these two conditions at the same time when we have considered a spaceship and razor nostrum. So we have to go one step further and consider a more general uh, space time or two different main faults. And this can be done by considering two razor nostrums. So now in addition to the other dimensionless variables that I have defined before, we have this relation or this ratio between the charges. And now the, met the condition of the metric leads to this equation number 12. That also reduces one parameter as compared to before. So since now we have three parameters, we have this 3D plot, and it's very difficult to know if there is an overlapping between the definitions. 
That's why we decided to start cutting this plot in several iterations, And it is what we have um, plot here in these three different plots. So again, this blue region are the regions where we have um, configuration stable under linear perturbations and gamma positive. And as we can see here, these are uh, different kinds of uh, eta. Uh, we can find that this um, blue egg here, it's starting to enter to this um, orange region. And here, this red region here, it's the overlap. And here we have positive energy densities and stable configurations. If we uh, cut all of this and we put it in one figure, we will find this um, plot here, where this red region is the total overlap in the different eta cuts. Remember that eta is the um, ratio between charges. X sub zero is the um, dimensionless radius of the shell and Y is the charge of one of the sites. So we have found that with two reserve nostrums, we can build uh, one hole that is stable under linear perturbation and has and is held by positive energy densities. Now, since our main aim is to find a qualitative new um, observable, and that is to find two photon rings, we want this transversable, we want a traversable one hole. What does it mean? That the radius of the shell has to be um, before the horizon radius, but after the photosphere radius. Or also we can decide to don't have a um, horizon. So those configurations that naturally doesn't have an horizon. So from the conditions that we have seen before, this plot here or this region here is the red uh, region that we have seen before, now depicted in terms of the eta parameter and x, x sub zero. And what we decided is to pick one value, for example, when eta is equal to two. And we find the two extremos that we can have for the radius of the initial one hole, the throat of the one hole. So we uh, took another value and basically here, we have depicted the blue region is the conditions in order to have um, a trigger, um, so a photon sphere and not an horizon in the main full M plus, and the gray one is the same one, but to the counterpart M, main full M minus. And we see here that this, um, four regions are, um, well, we have an overlapping of these four regions. So it is possible to have a traversable wormhole that is held by positive energy densities and it's stable under linear perturbations. So I with the value- Two minutes, yeah. Okay. So with the values that we have chosen, basically we have depicted the effective potentials that would see a photon and imagine that we have photon, uh, photon in this main for M plus. And when the impact perimeter is bigger than the critical one of this uh, site, basically would bounce back. When it's between the two values, we'll bounce, we'll go through the, the other main fold, and then we'll bounce back to the other main fold. And finally, when the impact perimeter is smaller than the critical parameter of this other side, basically we'll go through the one whole throat. And basically what we will see if we take a picture of the one hole is this plot here, where alpha and beta are the celestial coordinates. And we will see basically these two photon rings. Um, by the way, this um, picture is exaggerated. Usually the photon rings are far more thinner and well, but this is was just to make um, easier to understand what was uh, the result. And finally, here 
we have the trajectory of the photon in each of the main folds. So finally, um, to summarize, we have seen that it's not possible to find this type of configuration in uh, sparship and razor nostrum space times. But if we generalize to, to razor nostrums, we can find that we have an asymmetric stable wormhole and hold by positive energy densities. And moreover, um, also can have these double um, photon rings. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Merce, for a very nice talk. Okay, so we have time for questions. If, if, if somebody has a question, please say so or raise a hand. Uh, I saw somewhere uh, a hand raised. I can't see exactly where it is. Did somebody raise a hand? I did, I did. Oh, uh, uh, okay. Jean-Mich, please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so, for what I understand, like uh, the Schwarzschild solution is too simple to to build these wormholes upon. But um, could you do the same with a cosmological constant instead of a, of a charge, like uh, uh, Schwarzschild the Cedar solution, for example? Because I understand that the Schwarzschild one maybe is too simple to make this work, and so you you add the charge, right? Can you add something else besides the charge? So instead of the charge, consider a cosmological constant. Would it work? Or uh, is it possible to check that? It could be. Well, um, I don't have this <laughs> intuition, but perhaps if we do it, we can find some interesting result. So yeah, the thing is that the parameter space is too simple. And when we add this third um, um, parameter, then we have this 3D plot, and it's easier to have an overlapping of the region. So perhaps with this cosmological constant, we can this. Okay, sounds good. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have one more question, one more hand uh, raised by um, Messiak. So please go ahead. Hello. So it's Hello. actually a, a fo follow up to, to, to this comment. Uh, so I'm, I'm sorry because I will be asking uh, uh, the person asking the question. Um, so uh, I, I, I'm pretty sure it is possible to, to do the same construction uh, in a space time that is not asymptotically flat. But, uh, and I know there is a bunch of results in literature about shadows in such space times. Is there, but is there an observational reason for that? Because cosmological constant, well, it would be a very small factor uh, th that uh, would, wouldn't be important at all for these uh, shadows, uh, for, for black holes uh, seen in cosmological uh, distances. It, it would be only important if that was a really huge factor that is not something that observations uh, allow for. So uh, I'm, uh, my question is only, is there an observational relevance of that or is, there, uh, is it just a mathematical uh, exercise? So uh, I was asking because if um, if the cosmological constant has some terms that allow us to to make this uh, this kind of this kind of matching uh, without electric charge, it would be at least more physically relevant, more astrophysically relevant than considering an electric charge. Um, right. But that's that's only the the only point. Yeah. I think it's about the uh, same improbable <laughs> from the uh, observational slash astrophysical point of view. Okay, th thanks. Okay, so uh, let's thank uh, Mercy once again and um, go on to the next speaker, which is uh, well, precisely Masiak. So when you when you can, please share your screen, Masiak. Yes. Masiak Vilgas will be speaking about would we know wormhole if we saw one. <laughs> Let, let oh, me please. lower my hand and share my screen. Uh, okay, can you see that? Fine. Does yes, we look? can see it. Okay, okay, th th thank you. So uh, uh, I'm delighted to uh, talk about um, this uh, topic, uh, talk about it with you. Uh, I'm very much interested in your feedback. Uh, like, uh, honestly, I'm a, I'm a part of this group, uh, Event Horizon Telescope, and we would really like to see a wormhole. And even more, we would like to know if, if there was a wormhole and we observed it, would we actually be able to tell it from the, from the black hole in a, a more practical uh, observational terms? So 
it's it would be wonderful to hear your feedback and i will share some of the thoughts on the topic that that i have so let me first start very briefly with uh, introduction of this instrument event horizon telescope so now we have a tool um, that can resolve shadows of black holes for at least two objects in the universe uh, on a scale, spatial scale, angular scale of, of Schwarzschild radius. And one of those objects is published. The second one will be published uh, shortly. Uh, so Event Horizon Telescope is this collection, virtual network of uh, radio dishes all around the globe uh, that they act together and they virtually, through a magic of interferometry, they synthesize a single dish of the size equal to the distance between the telescopes, meaning Earth is the dish, but this dish is very corrupted. It is only active in a couple of points around the globe where we actually have the telescopes. But this gives us the amazing resolution, this amazing resolution being about 25 micro arc seconds at the moment, which is the same as if you would say, have your uh, newspaper opened in Rome, the, the meeting is, this virtual meeting is in Rome, I, I, I think, right? Um, and uh, you are reading it uh, from, say, Beijing. That's the sort of result when you need a resolution of 25 micro arc seconds. The best resolution we can, we had from the Earth uh, ever. And with this resolution, we have uh, seen uh, M87. Uh, if we use the mass and the distance uh, priors from the stellar dynamics, uh, we find that uh, the, res the resolution corresponds to about three Schwarzschild radii. So we are, we are really there to see the resolved features of the uh, shadow of a black hole. Um, and this is what we get. This is the image uh, that we get. Uh, so would that tool uh, of the Event Horizon Telescope enable us to uh, differentiate between wormhole and the black hole? That's the question. And if not, what do we need to improve? to get there? That is the, the question I am, well, more asking than uh, t telling you. Uh, uh, I, I don't have a very, very clear answer. So uh, there is some problem with the definitions. There is a little bit of a, a confusion. So what is this uh, shadow feature um, uh, actually? So most of the literature, uh, it is this uh, mathematical concept uh, of the critical curve. It's, it has different names. It can be apparent shape, from Bardeen 1973, it can be outline of the photon sphere, it can be a critical curve as uh, called by, by, by Sam Grala, I think. Um, now, uh, remember that all of that is in units of uh, mass over distance. So, uh, well, if you are saying that wormhole give a shadow that is 20% larger, well, to be able to find that, uh, we would need to know mass over distance of this object up to 20%. Unfortunately, there is no object other than center of our own galaxy where we really can say from astrophysics that we, that we have these constraints known so well. We have poor understanding, poor, poor measurements of both distance and, and mass for most of the objects. Like, order of magnitude uh, of, of a mass of a super distant supermassive black hole, this is a good measurement in astrophysics. So the size of the shadow, apparent shadow is not enough. There is another confusion in the, in the literature. There is sometimes a claim that uh, the shadow is an inner edge of what you would observe, that you would observe a feature and there would be a sharp uh, inner edge, like here. This is the Wikipedia animation from Bardeen's calculation of a Kerr uh, black hole shadow. That is not exactly true. This is only true if you have a wall of photons coming from infinity, but you can have emission from below the photon sphere. And then the, this emission would show up inside this uh, critical curve. So all of that is a little bit confusing. And the main confusion is, is the shadow the mathematic, mathematical concept or is it an observational shadow? Whatever we see is a shadow. So uh, one just have to be sure that we know what we, what we are talking about. Uh, so let's call observational shadow whatever uh, uh, the observations are showing. And let's call the critical curve this mathematical concept that is here in dashed, uh, plotted in da dashed lines. Uh, well, apart from that, astrophysics matters. Unfortunately, here are different solutions for the Kerr black holes from the one of the EHT papers. Uh, and uh, 
you can see how much uh, astrophysics matters. So by tuning spin parameter and some plasma physics parameter, you change the size of this apparent, uh, apparent feature uh, by a lot. And these are the histograms here to the right uh, of what sort of uh, size of the critical curve you would get from matching to those uh, images uh, realized in with different astrophysical parameters. So you can see how wide those posteriors are. So uh, if you see uh, that even horizon telescope gives you, well, there is a 40 micro arc second uh, ring in the sky. It actually can translate to many different values of critical curves because of these degeneracies in, in astrophysics. So what EHT observes, is still dominated by astrophysics, not by GR. And we need to understand astrophysics very well to be able to translate it into the constraints on space-time. So this is another problem with distinguishing between a black hole and a wormhole. So a very quick review of literature. Uh, there's been a lot of interest in last decade about uh, shadows of wormholes. All of that, I mean, what, what would uh, instrument like Event Horizon Telescope see looking at the wormhole? And it was really nice that there were these last two talks by Minyong and uh, Merce. Actually, Minyong was talking about these papers Wang and Peng et al. here. So I'm talking more about this 2020 Vilgus and Vincent Vanson uh, 2021. Uh, so we are getting a good review of the most recent uh, literature in this uh, uh, session, which is very nice. Um, so <laughs> if you read the literature, you can uh, find uh, very different uh, statements. You can uh, see uh, claims that shadow of rotating wormhole is larger than a uh, Kerr black hole. You can also find the statements that it's uh, smaller than the uh, uh, black hole. And uh, it turns out that this is because uh, you can define your wormhole in many ways. There is no unique construction of the, of the wormhole space time. It's just the topological dis uh, distinction, what is a, or is not a wormhole. So you can make it smaller. You can make it larger than the uh, shadow of a Kerr black hole, unfortunately. And by uh, shadow now, I mean critical curve. You can also, and I'm, I'm glad Matt Visser is in this, uh, in this call, um, you can also, of course, uh, make this, this sort of uh, thin shell uh, wormhole that Minion and Mercer were talking about uh, today. Um, then you glue Kerr solutions or you glue uh, Schwarzschild uh, so solutions. So then uh, the locations of the photon spheres are exactly the same and critical curves are the same as uh, in, in care solutions. So uh, there is this another degeneracy apart from astrophysics and not knowing M over D that you can also construct your wormholes in many different ways. So is it hopeless? Uh, is it hopeless? Uh, can we say that we will never know if we, if we see uh, some feature in the sky, we will never know if it's a wormhole or a, um, uh, of, of a, or a black hole. It's not entirely hopeless. It is only a bit hopeless. Uh, so uh, I said that we need to understand our astrophysics. I think so far the best attempt at simulating image of a wormhole with astrophysical constraints comes from this paper by Frederick Van Son and my, myself and a couple of colleagues published uh, earlier this year, when we actually tried to in, employ a proper astrophysical solution from M87, meaning we're not using uh, uh, any mod, a simple model of emission. We're not using thin disk. We are using uh, ADAF kind of solution, uh, 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 advection dominated accretion flow, which is a geometrically thick, optically thin solution. We are putting physics in here. The model is geometric, but we are putting the physics of the synchrotron emission inside here. And we are simulating what kind of image we would, uh, we would get. And this last column here is the image of a Lamy wormhole. Lamy wormhole is a sort of wormhole from a uh, uh, Kerr-like wormhole. Uh, so a rotating um, uh, one. It aso asymptotically goes to the Kerr solution here with spin of 0.8. And you co we fit this model to the actual data from the Event Horizon Telescope. So we check what kind of configuration of this wormhole gives us close, gets us closest to the image from the EHT. And we compare it with Kerr and Boson Star. And you can see that with the resolution of the EHT, which is the bottom row, they all look pretty much the same. 
So this is another argument that, well, it is still complicated for us at the moment to see a shadow of a, a wormhole from a shadow of a black hole. But there is an interesting thing. There are all those uh, high uh, spatial frequency uh, sharp features in the image uh, with both Lamy wormhole and boson star. And they, uh, they are coming from, um, well, they can be understood in terms of effective potential. So this is also something that Merce was um, uh, talking uh, about in her talk. So actually the sort of solutions uh, that uh, she was um, uh, referring to, uh, this uh, Reisner Nordstrom uh, wormhole stitched with uh, Schwarzschild uh, with the Madwizer's procedure, uh, this is something that uh, we uh, described in this paper uh, from 2020. Uh, you can identify the maxima of the effective potential uh, and you can associate them with the uh, critical curves, right? So the value of the uh, effective potential or inverse square root of this, of this value corresponds to the location of the critical curve. So now imagine that you are looking at this uh, wormhole from the left side here in this uh, figure uh, at the bottom, you will clearly see two maxima. So you will see the critical curve from your own space time and you will see the other side. You will see the critical curve from the other side as well. You may also see some stuff that has low angular momentum that is just going through the throat of the wormhole. So you can see something shining from the other side. Okay, so now this is something that you did never get uh, with, the, with the black hole. You would never expect uh, to see uh, in, in the middle of this shadow to see something bright because there is no other side. Everything uh, beyond the horizon is inaccessible to you. So here it is one thing that could really help us to, to distinguish wormhole uh, from the black hole. If we ever see brightness from the, from the inner part of the, uh, of the shadow. So this is, we, we have now one topological difference that maybe will save us and maybe we will uh, someday uh, see a difference between a uh, wormhole and a black hole. What is the, the other thing? Uh, that would be uh, these sharp features here. Uh, so if we ever see something like that, like we see a bunch of these sharp features, well, it is also something that you would never get uh, from the um, uh, Kerr black hole because when you would get a single family of photon rings, a single uh, family of rings. However, at the current resolution, as you see here, we have these families of photon rings, but with the resolution of the EHT, we're not there. We cannot really uh, make this distinction. So there is another emerging um, property of wormhole that we could, could help us to distinguish between a black hole and a wormhole. And that would be looking at these features at high spatial frequency. Okay, two minutes, please. Wonderful, I'm almost done. So, uh, so this is the um, little diagram showing uh, your different properties of this example of a wormhole that is uh, stitched Reisner Nordstrom and Schwarzschild. R1 is Schwarzschild here, R2 is uh, Reisner Nordstrom. The observer is looking from the right side. So what the observer would be uh, seeing uh, are two critical curves, the blue one and the red one, inside the view of the other side. But it's also interesting that there would be a reflection of your own space time. Uh, so the photons that bounce from this uh, effective potential flow here. So the photons with intermediate uh, values of the, uh, of the angular momentum. So it's kind of a mirror with a hole in the middle and there would be these two critical curves and two families of, of photon rings. Uh, this is, I think, my uh, semi-ultimate, uh, penultimate slide. This is about going into higher uh, spatial frequency. Uh, we are planning that. Uh, we would like to go to the, for instance, to the moon with, uh, with our radio telescope and use baselines between the Earth on, uh, and the moon. And then we would actually be sensitive mostly to these sharp features. Uh, I'm not giving you details what is in this uh, figure, but bear with me. The high, uh, uh, high values of this baseline length correspond to looking at very sharp features in the image, very high spatial frequencies. So if we get there and we're not there yet, we are only here, so far, 
um, we could really see the sharp features. So then we would be sensitive to this another topological property, multiple families of sharp uh, features in the image. So we have two things that possibly could help us to distinguish wormholes from, uh, from black holes, the brightness in the center and presence of uh, complicated topology of the sharp high spatial frequency features. So this is just a, just a little summary. Um, I'm not going to go through all these uh, points, but let me say that even now we would expect uh, that if we saw a brightness in the image of, uh, of M87 from the center, then we could already say that, well, it's clearly not a Kerr solution. We do not. We see that there is a dark darkness uh, in this center. So, so far we are, we are already making a very weak test between wormhole and a black hole. And we'll get better with the improved resolution when we are able to look at the sharp features. Okay, that's, that's all. Uh, thank you. And questions or comments? Yes, thank you very much, uh, Maciek. Um, well, one quick question. I'm sorry because I got uh, carried away by your fascinating talk that I lost track of time. <laughs> but there's one talk by Frederick. I mean, sorry, one question by Frederick. So please make it short, yeah. Frederick. Yes. Well, thank you. Thank you, Maciej, for the great talk. Uh, I, I was just wondering because you are you are concluding that if you don't see any emission at the center of the shadow, then you 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 you, you can be satisfied that it's not a wormhole. But what if you most of the emission is due to a jet, for instance, and you are seeing it face yeah. up, and you see the, <laughs> the jet coming towards you that can in projection be on top of the shadow, right? Right. So so Frederick, that's yeah the. Right, I wanted to say that this, this is uh, the, the, the only implication I wanted to make is in the direction that if we saw this brightness, then uh, not care solution, but you are right. In principle, uh, you can also mimic that in care space time if you are dominated by the jet, uh, because then your forward jet would make a little ring inside and there would be a lensed image of the uh, uh, of this jet going in the another in another direction, lensed and uh, going around it. So yes, you are making uh, the distinction between wormholes and black holes even more difficult, Frederick. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> so thank you very much. I'm sure there's more questions. So please, uh, please. Um, or put your questions in the chat to Maciek. I'm sure he will he, he will be very happy to answer them. Maciek, thank you very much again, okay? Thanks. So let's go on to the next talk, which is uh, by uh, PK Sahu, and he'll be speaking about uh, traversable wormhole geometries in symmetric teleparallel gravity. So PK, please go ahead. Thank you very much. So good morning. So am I audible? Yes. Hello. Yeah, uh, yes, we can yeah. hear you uh, okay. well. Thank you. So first of all, uh, let me thank Professor Lobo to giving me the opportunity to speak about my research. So the outline of the talk is basically I will go for a uh, wormhole model in uh, modified FQ gravity. So from the modified FQ gravity, I have chosen two models, uh, the linear form of the FQ and the nonlinear form. Then I will go for the MD diagram and the volume integral quantifier. So the basic motivation is between the GR and the FQ gravity. So GR fails to describe the dark sector of the inverse. Okay, and dark energy can be described by introducing the cosmological constant in GR, which is the most difficult part of Einstein. He added the cosmological constant, then he deleted the cosmological constant from the field equations. But in modified FQ gravity, though uh, we don't, don't need this uh, cosmological constant or any, any additional unknown candidate. So in FQ gravity, basically, these are very simple in comparison to general theory of relativity, because this Riemannian tensor contains the second order derivatives of metric tensor, whereas the non-metricity, the non-metricity term Q contains only the first derivative of the metric tensor. And in the symmetric teleparallel gravity, this is the metricity condition of the general theory of relativity, uh, which is relaxed, and it produces the teleparallel equivalent to the general theory of relativity. Okay, so the most important properties of the symmetric teleparallel gravity is their ability to separate the gravitational and the interstitial effects. So, which is not possible in the general theory of relativity. So, it has produced many strengths on the theory, such as the issues defining the gravitational energy momentum tensor. 
and in the fq gravity the nobel starting point for the modified gravity is it is new uh, which it is very new and simple generalization where the analytic self accelerating cosmological solutions are arise naturally in early and late time universe so the physical aspects of this uh, dynamical non metricity particularly the term q are not easy to interpret it is a gauge interpretation of the symmetric teleparallel gravity which is proposed in the reference 4 and the equivalence principle which allows enumerating the local gravitational so it makes to be integrable gauge theory so in this approach this metric representation of the gravitational field and the connection correspond to the gauge potential fine so in this uh, talk we have considered the spherically symmetric wormhole metric uh, which is given in equation 1 and this phi and the b are the redshift function and the shape function which are functions of the radial coordinate r and the minimum set of conditions for the wormhole geometry are the throat condition flaring out condition and the flatness condition which are given in equations 2 3 4 and finally the redshift function must be constant for a traversable wormhole now coming to the energy conditions as we know in the wormhole geometry the violation of null energy condition leads to the presence of exotic matter so there are four type of energy conditions they are the null energy condition weak energy condition then the strong energy condition and the dominant energy condition okay so basically i have to focus on my work so going to the work so the einstein hilbert axiom for the if you if you gravity is given in equation 9 so you can see if you change this fq to r then you can get the general theory of relativity now we have consider a energy momentum tensor of perfect fluid which is given in equation 10 so it has the density and tangential pressure and the radial pressures with the four velocity u mu and the space like vector v mu so the basic field equations coming to the non metricity q which is given in equation 11 we get the field equations taking this non metricity q and the wormhole metric with the energy momentum tensor we get the field equations which are given in equations 12 13 and 14 okay so to solve this field equations or to get the exact solutions of the field equations what we did we chose two different model so the first model is the linear form of the fq So we have chosen F Q is equal to alpha Q. So taking F Q is equal to alpha Q, the field equations 12 to 14 reduces the equations 15 to 17. Now in equations 15 to 17, there are three equations with four unknowns. So to get an exact solution, we have considered three models here. In the first model, we have take so this is basically the nonlinear form. So first I uh, gave the uh, field equations for the linear and nonlinear form. so in this nonlinear form fq is a q square plus b so you can see the higher powers of q q so which gives the field equations more different now coming to the linear form as i mentioned we have taken three models here so the first model is the anisotropic equation of state so the equation of state relating to the tangential pressure and radial pressure so taking the relation between the pressure we got the shape function which is given in equation 22 now the properties of this shape function or the three conditions the flaring out condition throat condition and the asymptotically flatness condition are plotted in figure 1 so one can observe that all the conditions are satisfied in the solution where we have taken the throat uh, is 1 and all the values are plotted for the parameter or the free constant m is less than 0 now coming to the physical parameters the density radial pressure and tangential pressure okay so this is the figure for the density and coming to the energy conditions so the energy conditions are plotted in figure 3 and you can observe that the null energy condition is violating for this model so which tells that there is a presence of exotic matter in this model and particularly we have not plotted the strong energy condition in this model as it becomes constant now coming to the second model the second model we have chosen the equation of state parameter is pr is equal to omega rho so taking the equation of state parameter between the energy density and the radial pressure 
we got the shape function which is given in equation 27 okay so we have considered this flatness condition for the equation of state parameter omega which is less than minus 1 so that means the model is in the phantom region now coming to the behavior of the shape function it is plotted in figure 4 then next uh, the behaviors of the energy conditions and the energy density so the energy density is positive and again coming to the energy conditions the null energy condition again violating in this model so in the second wormhole model the null energy condition violates indicating the presence of exotic matter then in the third wormhole so what we did we have chosen a specific shape function so we have taken a power law form of the shape function and the behaviors of the shape function for these uh, three conditions, the flaring out condition, a throat condition, and flatness condition was plotted in figure seven. Then the physical parameters, uh, the density and the energy conditions are given in these equations, and their behaviors are plotted in figure eight. Again, one can observe uh, the density is positive here, then the other no energy conditions are positive, whereas the null energy condition violating indicating the presence of exotic matter. So these are the two dimensional ending diagram for the three wormhole models. Now coming to the nonlinear form. So when we went for the nonlinear form, we have chosen a specific uh, shape function. So in this model, we have not taken the equation of state parameter because taking the equation of state parameter, we got the field equations are highly nonlinear and we are not able to solve this. Hence we went for the particular shape function. So taking this shape function, uh, these are the physical parameters and the behavior of the shape function is plotted in figure 10 and coming to the energy conditions. So you can see uh, the density is positive here and the null energy condition is violating and validating the other energy conditions for the particular shape function in the nonlinear case. Again, you have taken another shape function so in this shape function, when you went for this uh, BR is equal to gamma R naught into this, so in this particular form of the shape function, we got the physical parameters uh, rho and the energy conditions which are given in equations 37 to 39. Again, we plotted their behaviors. So you can see the uh, behavior of the shape function, then the three conditions, this uh, flatness condition, throat condition, and the asymptotical flatness condition. So all are satisfying here. Okay, two minutes. Okay, so now going for the energy conditions, again, you can observe the density is positive and the null energy condition is violating in certain region. Similarly here, and the other energy conditions are validating. So the violation of non-energy condition indicating again the presence of exotic matter. So again, we have plotted uh, the MD diagram in two dimension for both the models. Now coming to the three dimensional MD model. So as we know, uh, these are the two mouth and the wormhole throat. So we went for this MD diagram for our linear case, as it is difficult to plot for the nonlinear case. So this uh, MD diagram is presented for the linear case of the wormhole model. Now coming to the volume integral quantifier. So basically this volume integral quantifier gives the stability of these uh, wormholes. And for a spherically symmetric and average null energy condition, uh, the volume integral quantifier is given in equation 41. Then coming to our linear case, we have considered for the linear case, that is for the model one. So in the linear case for the model one, we have, plot, we have calculated the uh, volume integral quantifier and we have plotted in figure 16. So here the profile of the volume integral quantifier shown for the first model and the similar results will be obtained for the next model. And the details of this talk is recently published in Foster's Dar Physic. Now coming to the summary. So basically uh, we have taken uh, two models of FQ. One is the linear form of the FQ and other one is the nonlinear form of the FQ. And in the linear form, we have considered uh, three models. Uh, first two are the equation of state, and the third one is a particular shape function. Similarly, in the nonlinear form of the FQ, we have considered two specific shape functions.
so these are uh, some of the references and you can get the details of this talk in this article so thank you thank you for your patience thank you pk so um we have time for one question yes please anybody anybody wants to put a question well um there's there's a few questions but maybe it's best to pass on okay pk uh, due to the time we can speak later as well so thank you okay. very much once again okay yeah thank and, you and uh, let's go to the next speaker who is alex simpson and uh, alex will be speaking about from black bounds to, to traversable wormhole and beyond so alex the floor is yours thank you very much Oh, thanks for that, Francisco. Just give me two seconds. Here we go. Uh, can you hear me okay? Perfect. Thank you. Fantastic. Okay. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to you all, wherever you may be. Uh, my name is Alex Simpson, and I'm a PhD student of Professor Matt Visser at Victoria University of Wellington. And today I'll be talking to you about from black bounce to traversable wormhole and beyond. So before I kick into it, I'd just like to thank Francisco and Diego for organizing and chairing this 83 parallel session um, and thank them for the opportunity to share some of our research with all of you. So firstly, it's important to note, I will be presenting a series of candidate spacetimes. Uh, these spacetimes at this stage are not exact solutions to some equations of motion in a specific physical setting. Rather, these are geometric models that have been chosen because they possess some specific desirable features. And then they have been coupled to the Einstein equations and analyzed through the lens of standard general relativity. So the family of candidate spacetimes that I will be presenting are terminolog terminologically deemed to be black bounce spacetimes. And I'll explain what that means in a second. Firstly, we'll look at the discourse in static spherical symmetry. Then we will add a temporal dependence and look at dynamics in spherical symmetry. And finally, we'll migrate the discussion to the more astrophysically relevant uh, regime of stationary axisymmetry. I'll go through this introduction fairly quickly uh, due to the time constraints, but essentially to motivate the research, GR is fantastic, but it isn't perfect. One of its imperfections is the prediction of curvature singularities, which is at least in part why Roger Penrose was awarded the 2020 Nobel Prize in Physics for the Penrose Singularity Theorem. So when we see these infinities popping up in a physical theory, it goes against our human intuition, as we should think mass occupies volume, and we seek to cull those infinities from the theory and then see what that would imply. So all of the candidate spacetimes that I'm presenting today are globally non-singular or regular. As far as physics sanity checks go, they pass all of the weak field observational tests of general relativity, and they belong either to the class of what we call regular black holes or traversable wormholes, which I'm sure all of you are, are well familiar with. So I'll go over this quite quickly. A regular black hole, we mean in the sense of James Bardeen, as presented in 1968. So it's just a, uh, a definition mathematically where we enforce global finiteness on the non-zero curvature tensor components in the Riemann curvature invariance. This obviously has implications on mathematical tractability. It also has implications on violation of some of the energy conditions uh, associated with general relativity. By traversable wormhole, we mean in the sense of Morris and Thorne as defined in their seminal paper in 1988. So that definition presented therein can be reduced to this statement you see on screen. You've got a horizon-free geometry with a centralized throat, which is a time-like hypersurface connecting two asymptotically Minkowski regions of space-time, satisfying the flare-out condition that the area function of the constant R hypersurface as a local minima at the throat. Both of these objects are basically black hole mimickers in the sense that they are cold, dark, and heavy. Although, as Matsiek pointed out, hopefully the wormholes are not actually so dark and we can one day actually uh, delineate between those objects. Um, these things are globally non-singular. They're alternatives to classical black holes. And importantly, I want everyone to sort of think about mathematical tractability as I go forward, because the candidate spacetimes I'm presenting are, are quite tractable and therefore they're amenable to the extraction of astrophysical observables. So let's look at the research. The first uh, presentation of one of these black bounce spacetimes is in static spherical symmetry in a paper by Matt and myself, which was published in the Journal of Cosmology and Astroparticle Physics back in 2019. Uh, since then, it's received a fair bit of attention and it's actually received this moniker, uh, the Simpson Space Time. 
So the proposed spacetime candidate is represented by the wine element in equation one. And the motivation there was to minimally modify Schwarzschild and the standard curvature coordinates such that one, you have a resulting candidate spacetime that is mathematically tractable, and two, it is globally regular or globally non-singular. So when you view it as a modification of Schwarzschild, we map the Schwarzschild mass parameter m to this new function m of r, and you can see that there's been a new scalar parameter a invoked in, in that transformation there, uh, not a transformation, but uh, the coefficient of the two sphere has now been changed from r squared to r squared plus a squared. And what this all does is actually give you quite interesting causal structures. But firstly, we have neat limiting behavior. So if you take the limit as m goes to zero of what was equation one, then you reproduce exactly the two-way traversable wormhole geometry that is discussed in the seminal paper by Morrison Thorne. And in the A equals zero limit, you reproduce the Schwarzschild solution in the standard Schwarzschild curvature coordinates. So qualitatively, invoking this new scalar parameter means that we get these different causal structures. Uh, there's an A-dependent horizon structure. As said, A equals zero is Schwarzschild. When A is in the range zero to two M, we have a regular black hole in the sense of Bardeen. A equal to 2m, and this was an unexpected result uh, at the time of analysis, but you get this novel geometry, which is actually a one-way wormhole with an extremal null throat. And when A is greater than 2m, we just get a canonical uh, standard two-way traversable wormhole in the sense of Morrison Thorne. So I'm sure that everyone's familiar with the Carter-Penrose diagram for Schwarzschild and probably for a standard traversable wormhole. So let's look at the two more interesting cases. When A is in the range 0 to 2M, we have a regular black hole in the sense of Bardeen, and qualitatively this picture looks very much like maximally extended Schwarzschild stacked on top of each other. Um, and in fact, I've truncated the diagram. The time coordinate extends up the page and goes off the page and goes all the way to infinity, so you can have infinitely many copies of this. Uh, and in terms of the would-be observer propagating through the space-time, they can come out of our universe through the horizon all the way to this bounce hypersurface, which is a space-like hypersurface at the coordinate location r equals zero. And this is where we've called this hypersurface uh, black bounce, hence the name of the family of spacetimes. Uh, you bounce through that hypersurface into a future reincarnation of our own universe. And then you can happily go and do the same thing again uh, infinitely many times. The quite curious and interesting geometry when A is equal to 2M uh, is actually a one-way wormhole geometry. So you do still get a horizon. Uh, it's kind of a squishing of the space-like and, and time-like horizon surfaces, if you will, uh, at R equals zero. And this is a null hypersurface. We can pass through it and we may never return. So zigzagging up the page, one goes like this and keeps shooting off to infinity. Um, so in the original paper, we also analyze some standard uh, general relativity calculations. We extract ISCO and photon sphere locations, discuss the surface gravity and the Hawking temperature. And yes, we discussed the implications on the energy conditions. It was an expected result. And we found that the null energy condition is manifestly violated in the region outside any would-be horizons. And of course, in static spherical symmetry, that is sufficient to conclude that all of the standard energy conditions in general relativity are similarly violated. There's been quite a bit of research analyzing this specific candidate spacetime, uh, thorough analysis of the quasi-normal modes, there's been analysis of shadows, gravitational lensing effects, some precession phenomena, um, and even some analysis exporting the discourse out of standard general relativity and into some alternative theories of gravity as well. And while we're still in static spherical symmetry, uh, it's worth noting a paper by Matt, myself, and Francisco, as well as Manuel Rodriguez and Marcos Silva in Brazil. Uh, this paper was published in Physical Review D, and we extend the discourse by analyzing the following two parameter extension to the Simpson Vista spacetime. And by allowing these additional degrees of freedom, we get some candidates that have quite a rich, uh, rich causal structures, as well as presenting some general theorems concerning regularity. So that's in static spherical symmetry. Um, now we can introduce some dynamics and, and discuss dynamics in spherical symmetry. Uh, before I go on to the next slide, it's worth briefly mentioning that a thin shell variant of the Simpson Vista space time was also analyzed in a paper by Francisco, Matt, and myself, uh, published in Physical Review D. And for that particular analysis, we analyze, uh, did a linearized stability analysis on radial perturbations of the wormhole throat in the thin shell construction. So another paper where we've introduced time dependence and spherical symmetry uh, was by Matt, myself, and Prado Martin Moruno. Uh, and in this paper, published in Classical and Quantum Gravity, we play a Vaida-like trick. So we map to sort of Eddington-Finkelstein coordinates with an outgoing or ingoing null time coordinate, and then we simply allow the mass parameter to depend on that null time coordinate. And so you can see that the candidate spacetime is now expressed by this line element in equation five. And the whole point is that qualitatively, we now get a dynamic horizon location. 
So the horizon location is characterized there by equation six. And because it is dynamic, we get some quite interesting phenomenology. So specifically, if you take a decreasing mass function, which corresponds to choosing the outgoing null time coordinate, as this decreases over the A over two limit, you actually get going from horizons to no horizons. So you're describing the evaporation of a regular black hole that leaves a wormhole remnant. Um, conversely, if we pick the ingoing null time coordinate, then increasing mass function crossing the A over two limit actually describes the conversion of a wormhole to a regular black hole by the accretion of null dust. So the Carter Penrose diagrams for those phenomenological models uh, I'll present now. So here we can see that which was a regular black hole, Hawking evaporates away and so you've got a horizon, got a horizon and then the horizon disappears and you're left with this two-way traversable wormhole uh, as your remnant. And the other case, we have that which was a two-way traversable wormhole, accretes null dust, accretes null dust and becomes sufficiently massive to form an apparent horizon and then you obtain a regular black hole in the sense of Bardeen. Okay, uh, so now we'll migrate the discourse to the astrophysically relevant setting, so adding rotation. A quite interesting paper was, was published this year in JCAP as well uh, by Edgardo Franzin, Stefano Liberati and Jacopo Mazza, a novel family of rotating black hole mimickers. And in this paper, they discovered the Kerr analog that is part of the black bounce family of space times. And they did this by using the Newman Janus procedure. So applying the NJP to Simpson Visser, they kick it rotating. And amazingly, the resulting candidate spacetime is not only quite tractable, it's globally regular and still neatly interpolates between uh, traversable wormholes and regular black holes. So obviously, this is the most astrophysically relevant member of, of the family of black bound spacetimes. It's the, the analog to Kerr. Uh, the causal structure is, of course, slightly more complicated because we are now in axisymmetry, but it's still quite clean. It separates into six qualitatively different cases, um, and you can draw nice Carter Penrose diagrams for all of these. And obviously, the, the cases differ depending on whether or not you have zero horizons, one horizon, uh, or an outer and an inner horizon, two horizons. So supplementary to that, the discourse was taken further um, in a recent paper by Matt, myself, and Edgardo Stefano Jacopo, uh, charged black bounce space times, which has been accepted for publication at JCAP. And in this paper, we analyzed the full family and the black bounce Kern Newman, uh, adding a, a non-zero electrical charge. So crucially, as Q goes to zero, we restore the black bounce Kerr variant. Um, this space time has the same qualitative cases for the causal structure. And quite interestingly, we, we discussed this for quite a while, the, the interpretation of the charge dependent components of the stress energy tensor. So there's actually two uh, equally sane interpretations. One of them is that we have nonlinear electrodynamics in the presence of a charged dust. And the other is that we have standard Maxwell electromagnetism in the presence of an anisotropic fluid. Um, so that was quite an interesting little result. And then crucially, we've proven that the scalar wave equation is separable on the black bounce Kerr Newman space time and also on the black bounce Kerr space time. Okay, and so now I'll go on to discuss what we've what we've been talking about. So the black bounce space times holistically are a family of candidate space times which neatly interpolate between traversable wormholes and regular black holes, pass all weak field observational tests of standard general relativity, and they're very mathematically tractable. So they're they're desirable to do some work with. And the different settings in which we've discussed these, the static spherical symmetry, of course, uh, where the original simpson space spacetime is from. Then we've applied some different dynamics in, in different ways, one of them in the paper with Prado, another in the stability analysis on the thin shell variant, uh, still in spherical symmetry. And finally, we've migrated the discourse to stationary axisymmetry. So what's interesting to me, I guess, and, and hopefully to some of you uh, listening is, is the future research. And of course, we've now proven that the scalar wave equation is separable on black bounce Kerr Newman. This indicates immediately that someone should thoroughly analyze the quasi-normal modes and associated ring down so it can speak to the LIGO calculation. Uh, it would also be theoretically interesting and potentially practical to analyze the separability of the electromagnetic wave equation, and maybe we can discuss Maxwell fluctuations. Uh, and it would also be interesting to analyze the separability of the Dirac equation as well. Uh, so these are all things that, that we're sort of thinking about currently. Um, and yeah, so that's the family of Blackdown Space Times. Thank you very much. And thanks once again to Francisco and to Diego. Thank you, Alex. Thank you very much for the fantastic talk. Uh, and also for um, keeping on time. So we have time for um, a few questions. If um, anybody, okay. So we have um, a hand raised, so please go ahead. Jean I, I, I wanted to ask about the, the predicted differences in, uh, for example, in the gravitational wave signal 
if you have a binary of uh, of these black bounces colliding like well, what what are the expected differences like in the in the quasi normal modes maybe in the phase uh, something hmm. So my understanding is that that's somewhat open at this stage. So there has been a thorough analysis of the quasi-normal modes uh, radiating out of an eternal uh, simpson Vissa black hole. And that was performed and published about 18 months ago, I think. But I'm not too sure if the in-spiral calculations and, and the associated ring down with LIGO, I'm not too sure what progress has been made there per se. So I can't actually comment on the explicit differences with any kind of confidence or meaning here and now. I'd have to go away and read, read those papers in more detail. Mm. Okay, so um, as we're over time, uh, thank you again, Alex, for the great talk. Uh, I will pass much. now, thank you very much. I will pass now the uh, chair to, to Diego and he will be the uh, chair for the next six talks. So thank you very much, Diego, please. Okay. So, uh, Francisco, because I cannot remember how exactly to invite you out to, to, to share his screen. I can do it, I can do it. Ah, okay. Okay. Please okay, so our reporting. next speaker is Joao Luis Rosa, who is going to talk about double layers one holes in quadratic hybrid metric palatine gravity. Okay. Thank you very much. So uh, let me start by stating that, um, well, GR is, a, is a, very, a very successful theory. So any, I believe that any, any talk about modified theories of gravity should somehow motivate why why should we care about modified gravity if GR is so successful. And while there are many problems with GR and in particular for uh, for the purpose of this talk we are interested in wormholes so I think we should say that the only problem in GR related to wormholes is the fact that it, pre it, um, it predicts the existence of exotic matter right so we know that for wormholes to to exist in GR we need to somehow violate the energy conditions and uh, and that's a problem. So to solve this problem, one usually recurs to modified gravity. And there are many ways one can, can modify uh, GR. Uh, one of such ways is by adding extra fields to the action, like scalar fields, vector fields, or even tensor fields. And another way is by adding higher order terms to, to, the, to the action, like a function of the Ricci scalar, the Ricci tensor, et cetera. And sometimes actually these two approaches are equivalent to each other, which is something that happens, for example, in FFR. Now the interest, uh, the theory I'm interested with, uh, I'm interested in in this uh, in this talk is the hybrid metric Palatini gravity. In this theory, the action is a function not only of the Ricci scalar but also in this uh, in this Palatini Ricci scalar, which is defined just in the same way as a Ricci tensor, but as a function the Ricci scalar, but as a function of an independent connection. Let's call it gamma hat. And so this action is a function of two independent variables, the metric G and also the independent connection gamma hat, just like it happens for, for the, the Palatini variation of GR. We can compute two equations of motion. This is the equation of motion for the metric, so the field equations, and this is what comes from the equation of motion from the connection. So this implies that the two Ricci tensors, the Ricci tensor, the usual one defined in terms of the metric G and the Palatini Ricci tensor, they are somehow related by a conformal relation, as you can see here. And the field equations, they are very much similar to what happens in F of R uh, with, uh, with a few extra terms. So if you choose, for example, metric F of R, you do not have this term, but you have all the others. If you choose Palatini F of R, you do not have neither this term nor this term, but you have these two. So in the hybrid metric Palatini gravity, you somehow combine the features of both the metric and the Palatini approach to F of R in the same field. Now the equation of motion for the connection is not exactly this one, but instead this is the one. This implies that there is a new metric conformally related to the metric G for which this independent connection is Levi Civita. And this is exactly what brings us to this conformal relation between the, the Ricci scalar and the Palatini Ricci scalar. Now in this work, we will try to uh, build wormhole solutions using the junction conditions of the theory. So let's uh, just introduce some notation about the junction conditions in here. I'm going to define sigma as a hypersurface dividing the interior space-time V minus to the exterior space-time V plus. These two space-times are written in a set of coordinates X minus and X plus. And in the, in the hypersurface sigma, there is a set, of, um, a set of coordinates Y alpha. This vector NA is the vector perpendicular to, to the hypersurface sigma. So using this notation, one can define the induced metric H alpha beta as the projection of the metric GIB onto the upper surface. So these vectors E A alpha and E B beta are the projectors from the four dimensional space time to the three dimensional upper surface. 
and the extrinsic curvature is pretty much the projection of the covariant derivative of the the normal vector so you take the normal derivative of the, of the covariance of the of the normal vector you project it onto the hypersurface and you get the extrinsic curvature now using these two definitions the junction conditions of the theory are given by this so the metric this the um, this square parenthesis denote the jump of a given quantity across the upper surface. So what this means is that the jump of the induced metric is equal to zero, or in other words, this means that the induced metric must be continuous across the upper surface. The induced metric as seen from the interior and as seen from the exterior at the upper surface must be the same. Now there are other junction conditions coming from, um, coming from this, uh, this theory. One of those is the trace of the extrinsic curvature must be also continuous across the upper surface. And also the Ricci scalar and the Ricci tensor of the two spacetimes, the interior and the exterior, must also be continuous at the upper surface. In the upper surface, there will be or not a thin shell separating the two spacetimes. And the stress energy tensor of this thin shell is S alpha beta, which is given in terms of the jumps of the derivative of the Ricci tensor, the, the Ricci scalar, and the, the extrinsic curvature. So if you choose, for example, two space times in such a way that the derivative of the Ricci scalar is continuous across the upper surface, this first term disappears. If you choose these space times in such a, such a way that the, the extrinsic curvature is continuous across the upper surface, this second term disappears and the stress energy tensor of the thin shell is zero. So the matching between the two space times is smooth. Now, the thing is, are there any particular forms of the theory for which these set of junction conditions can be simplified? And the answer is yes. So just like it happens in f of r, there are particular forms of a theory. In case of f of r, it's, uh, it's the quadratic version of f of r for which some of these junction conditions can be discarded. In our case, in the abrimetric palatini gravity, the function we need to consider to simplify the set of junction conditions is a function that is quadratic in the Ricci scalar and linear in the palatini Ricci scalar. And why is that so? Well, because if we choose this form of the function f, these derivatives of the function f disappear, and this effectively eliminates the undefined terms. So the junction conditions come when something is undefined in distribution formalism. For example, if you have products of the Heaviside function with a delta function, this product is undefined in distribution formalism. Or if you have a delta function times a delta function, this product is, um, is divergent in the distribution formalism. So to avoid these kind of problems, you have to force these terms to disappear. And when you try to force the terms to disappear, you are imposing a junction condition. Now, the thing is, if you choose a function f of this form, these extra terms that depend on these derivatives, they will automatically disappear from the field equations. And so you do not need to impose extra conditions to guarantee that these products, these problematic products are there. So this kind of simplifies the set of junction conditions. And in fact, one can discard the continuity of the Ricci scalar and the Palatini Ricci scalar. What's the cost of that? Well, the cost is a double gravitational layer will appear at the separation upper surface. This means that extra terms will appear in your uh, stress energy tensor. Your stress energy tensor will be given not only by the interior and the exterior stress energy tensors, this one multiplied by the, by the Heaviside functions, not only by the stress energy tensor of the thin shell, this SAB, but then you will have fluxes and tensions on the hypersurface and also this extra thing here that is called the double layer stress energy tensor distribution which is defined in this way now up to today we are still making research to somehow find the physical interpretation for what this um, this double layer distribution is there are many different uh, different papers working on this i think so far the best interpretation we have is that this, distribu this distribution works as a gravitational dipole at the hypersurface. But then again, this is, still, this is still an open topic of discussion. We know that mathematically it appears, but we are still trying to figure out exactly what this means in a physical sense. Now we are interested in using these junction conditions to find wormhole solutions. And so um, in particular, we want the, the wormholes to be traversable. There are two conditions we have to impose. The first of all is that the space-time presents no horizons. And the second one is that the throat remains open when the, when the observer tries to traverse the, the wormhole. This is called the flaring out condition. These two conditions can be translated by two bounds on the, the redshift function, which I call zeta. I know usually it's called phi, but uh, phi is the name I call the, 
uh, in my other paper, phi is the name I called to a scalar field. So I, I, I called it zeta here. And B is the shape function of the, of the, of, of the wormhole. So for the space time to present no horizons, the redshift function must be finite. And for the throat to remain open, the derivative of the shape function at the throat of the wormhole must be smaller than one. So where do these functions appear? Well, the redshift function is just this exponent here in GTT, and the shape function is this function B of R that appears in GRR. Now, as I said before, the problem of finding wormholes in GR is that the null energy condition is, um, is violated. So in here, we are interested in solutions that satisfy the null energy condition. So let's try to use some very broad forms of the redshift and the shape function. You have a couple of minutes left. Thank you. And let's see what happens. And what we find is that the null energy condition is satisfied at the throat and somewhere else, but it is violated in the middle. So we need to somehow find a solution that satisfies the null energy condition everywhere. So let's use the junction conditions. We consider the exterior spacetime to be a Schwarzschild spacetime, and we can find we perform the matching between the two spacetimes, and we find the density and the pressure of the thin shell. They are very ugly, but they can be calculated because we know the interior and the exterior spacetime. So in the end, uh, our wormhole looks something like this. In the exterior, we have vacuum, Schwarzschild. There is a double layer separating the interior of the exterior. We have the perfect fluids of the wormhole and inside we have the throat. And if you compute the sigma and the pressure, you will find that they, um, they are both positive and they sum to a positive value. So the thin shell satisfies the null energy condition. So in conclusion, we have found the wormhole solution that satisfies the, the null energy condition everywhere and that this wormhole is supported by double gravitational layers just as it happens in, uh, in F of R. Now, of course, uh, the, main, the main problem we wanted to solve is not only the fact that the energy condition is violated, but also in our work in general, hybrid magic Palatini, we have found that wormholes require fine tuning to, to, be, to be built. And by dropping these two, these two junction conditions, we solve the fine tuning problem. The solutions here are immense and, uh, and very easy to find. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joao, for your talk. Uh, so we have time for a uh couple of questions, if there is uh, any in the audience. Okay, any question? Okay, so Gonzalo, please go ahead. Uh, yes, um, so my question is, if you add a quadratic Palatini uh, Ricci, uh, then what happens to the uh, double shell? Well, if you have, if you have, um, uh, quadratic Palatini here, right? If you if you had something like uh, delta r squared, uh, this will mean that this um, this derivative here is uh, is non-zero. And so, if this derivative is non-zero from the equation of motion for the for this one, if this derivative is non-zero, so if this f of r is not a constant, then you will have products d a f of r d b f of r, which can be written in terms of products of d a of r and d b of r, and the same for the for the, the, the curly R and the uh, curly, derivative of curly R and derivative of curly R. And so to make sure that these products do not, um, do not give rise to, to extra junction conditions, uh, you will not be able to, to get rid of one of these, uh, this one, this one, junction conditions. So oh. you really need this, uh, this function to be only linear in the, um, in the Palatini, in the Palatini Ricci scalar to avoid these two junction conditions to appear. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay, Joao, thank you. So let's go to the next speaker. Thank okay. you. Okay, who is, uh, okay. So, mm, okay. So Sun Wong, uh, are you there? Okay. Okay, so if you can share your screen. Okay, so our next speaker is uh, Sun Wong Kim, who is going to talk about gravitational waves generated by a slowly rotating one hole. Please go ahead. Uh, can you see my screen? Yeah, we can see it and we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you to the organizers to have a chance uh, uh, presentation at uh, uh, MG16 at the uh, 83 sessions. Uh, my title is the gravitational waves generated by a slowly rotating OMO. My name is someone came from Korea. 
Okay, the motivation of this research is that the detection of gravitational wave by light of uh, in great success of opening windows to researches of new era. Omer can also be an astrophysical compact object, which is one of the candidates of the gravitational wave source, even though their existence is still not clear. However, we think that there are sufficiently values to consider the, the gravitational wave by one more and mix the pairs with the black hole or neutron stars. And also we are trying to find any footprints of one more such as gravitational lensing shadows and the particle creation. So if we succeed in detection of gravitational wave generated by one more, it also can be a added to the list of more evidence. As the first step to the gravitational wave study generated by Omer, we considered the, considered the toy model of rotating Omer with uh, oscillating the throat. For the simplest Omer, we adopted the two cases, rotating Alice Omer and potential Omer by two copies of black holes. Uh, for the rotating one more, uh, there is a uh, model uh, developed by Teo in 1998. So the metric of the rotating one more is like this. Here, n is the shift function and the b is, is the uh, shape function. And n is the uh, proper length, and k is the proper length. And omega is the angular velocity, which gives rise to the frame dragging determined by the angular momentum. And we start from the core metric in boyer lindquist coordinate. It's given like this. And with this metric, the event horizon and August period is defined by the R sub plus and R sub zero. And here, J is the angular momentum. And sometimes we use A is the angular momentum per unit mass. And also, uh, we can the <coughs> redefine the mass and the angular momentum like this. So uh, if we, the script M <coughs> is given like this, then M is in, uh, length unit and script J is the angular momentum in length scale unit. And the A is given the script J by script N. <coughs> and we expand this curve metric in the line element in power of one of R and then uh, we can compare with the, the Tails model then, uh, if we're comparing this Tails model and if we're comparing the, the cross term, the DTD phi, then uh, we can define the angular velocity omega is given like this. So omega is given to Z C over R cube. So uh, from the Taylor's model, uh, if we set the, the BR, the shape function is given the R not, uh, B not to square of R and N as K is one unit, then it is just the rotating Alice one more like this. So uh, the D phi is changed into the only the D phi minus omega DT so we call it the rotating Alice Omer. If the omega is uh, zero, then it is just like the Alice Omer. So we start from this metric as a rotating Alice Omer. And well, for the energy density, uh, in autonomous basis, we start from the Einstein's equations and uh, for the simplicity, we adopt the, the perfect fluid model like given this. 
and it has the angular momentum around the, the z axis. So there is a, a four velocity component u3. So uh, there are two, some relationship like this. And from the Einstein equation and uh, Bogliaf and the Hippert has the, some uh, hint to derive the uh, energy density from the uh, Einstein's equation. So the energy density rho is given the d zero zero minus g three three plus g two two. So from this relationship, we can uh, evaluate the energy density of the uh, rotating LS normal in terms of the B0. B0 is the minimal throat size and the, the angular momentum Z. If the angular momentum is zero, then the density is uh, given like this. It's uh, just the typical form of the normal. Uh, and it has the negative value. So uh, we can uh, draw the, the NS density in, turn in R coordinate and the theta coordinate. And the density depends on R and the theta, and uh, it has the, the uh, maximum value at the equator and uh, diminish at the near to poles. And at the throat, uh, uh, R is equal to B0, the density is negative. And near to zero, assume, near to zero, asymptotically. So, and uh, we can see the, the dependence on the angular momentum of the distribution. So when angular momentum is uh, larger and larger, then we have a chance to have a positive density. But uh, for the case of uh, the small angular momentum, then the density is negative. So if there is some values, then greater than some value, then there are two points to, to have a zero density. So between these two values, then they have a chance to have a positive energy density. But in this case, the angular momentum should be something Mm, uh, less than some values. And in set of the distribution, also there is a, um, this kind of the position for the uh, larger angular momentum then. And it is a high value at the equator and the two poles there is a very low values. And also we try to calculate the quadrupole moment hmm, components. So uh, we should try to calculate the uh, tasteless, the transverse components uh, of the quadrupole moment. Then we can see this, that, like this. So the components of quadrupole moments is positive uh, because the, the when we see the energy density, then the dominant term is negative minus uh, minus v zero square r to the eight is the dominant term, but it, this term does not affect on the calculation of the quadrupole moment. So the second, the, the next dominant term, the angular momentum dependent term gives the the effect on the. Uh, for moment, so it is positive ones. And also the QYY is the same to this one, and uh, this has a relationship. So it has uh, shows the, the diagonal term and it has trace list ones. Uh, sorry, two minutes left. Two minutes? Yeah. I'm sorry. So I just contract my the minute. So uh, we can see the validity of the slowly rotating meaning. So uh, anyway, uh, okay, I'll reduce my one. So if we put the time dependence, then we can the strain and the uh, luminosity is given like this. So uh, it depends on the uh, angular momentum square to the 
and also inverse it to the through the size. And also for the thin shell wall mold, then we can see the fortunately find the the energy density is like given like this at the thin shell model. So from this, we can see the some negativeness of the density. And also we can try to find the validity of the slowly rotating assumptions. So, but however, in this case, the, there is some limit of the uh, assumptions. So in this case, such a mass should be the less than the a solar mass. So if the mass is higher than this, then this assumption is not valid. So, and with this uh, uh, assumption, so we can calculate the uh, component of uh, quadruple moment and the strain, but it has also the uh, BQ dependence. So it's the same as the case one. So from this one, we can try this. So this is summary of my work. So we consider the, the, the toy model of gravitation wave generation by LS1 more and tensional more to consider the, the relationship of gravitation wave with one more by assuming the slowly rotating case on the general conditions such as mass limit. We examine the nature of any density to see the differences from gravitation wave from normal matter. We can see the signature only, the negative property of the density. And the, the, they do not affect on the components of the quadruple moment. We found the amplitude and the gravitational wave luminosity and the lifetime of the woman in and the they in terms of throat size and angular momentum. But the order of magnitude is very small uh, comparing to the binary mode cases. At the next step, we will try to find the gravitational wave generation by different situations relating to WOMO, such as binary mode, etc. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your talk. Uh, if there are any questions in the audience, please raise your hands in case you have any questions. Okay, so if there are no questions, so let's stand the speaker again and, and let's go to the, to the next speaker. Thank you for your talk. Thank you. Okay, so our next speaker is going to be Gonzalo Olmo. Okay, so Gonzalo, are you there? Yes, I'm here. I'm trying to share my screen. Okay, so you have to see an invitation to share your screen. Uh, yes, but this is asking for permissions. Um, I have to exit and come in again. Sorry. Okay, okay. Yeah, that's the same problem I have before. So, so let me see if I can do it now. Uh, yes, now I see the slides. Okay, very good. Sorry, it was the first time in this computer. Okay, so can you see the slides? Uh, I can hear you, uh, Diego. Uh, is that okay, some... sorry. Uh, yeah, we can hear you and see your slides. So, okay. so our, our next speaker is Gonzalo Olmo, who is going to talk about particle creation by wormholes, a toy model. Okay. Go ahead. Okay, so as the title says, uh, I'm going to focus on quantum aspects of wormholes. So I'm not going, I'm going to minimize the uh, modeling of the wormhole just to the minimum. So I'm going to work in uh, one plus one dimension, one spatial dimension, one plus time. And uh, my interpretation of a wormhole is uh, this simple. So it is something that when you reach it, then it transfers anything that reaches the entrance to the exit. So the entrance is at some point and the exit is at another point, okay? <clears throat> so in this case, we are dealing with waves. I'm considering a, a massless scalar a quantum field in, in one plus one dimensions. So, and I explore what happens uh, if there is anything interesting when uh, these things happen, okay? When the, the scalar wave reaches some point and comes out from another uh, uh, place. So this is the entrance of the wormhole and the exit of the wormhole. But since we are in one plus one dimensions, uh, 
Uh, so we need to work in in space time, not just in space. So uh, we need to uh, to get some intuition of what's going on. We use the uh, the Penrose diagram, and here in red, I'm representing the entrance of the wormhole. Okay, and in blue, we have the exit of the wormhole. Okay, very good. This is very simple. And in particular, uh, here I'm representing to uh, the, the entrance is located at some fixed position in x, x, x zero, and the exit is displaced by some constant uh, value to the to the left. Okay. And uh, our idea now I'm simplifying the the entrance is at rest at the center, and the exit is located at some uh, constant position to the left. Okay. So when any incoming wave reaches the entrance, it is automatically transferred to some point in the exit. Okay, so uh, since this is a massless uh, scalar wave, so uh, it follows geodesics, which are straight lines with constant uh, x plus uh, variable. And uh, once it touches the entrance, it comes out from the exit and follows another uh, constant trajectory. Okay, the wave doesn't change in this process, because this is what the work will do, does. When you get there, you want to appear on the other side. You don't want to be transformed. Okay, so the, we are just demanding that. Okay, that whatever comes in is what comes out. So in this simple problem with waves, uh, we can say that we have uh, the transmission coefficient is equal to one. So there is no reflection. Okay, so that would be an additional complication uh, that should happen in physically realistic uh, scenarios. That not because you know, so we are all uh, made of quantum particles, so we, we should have a Transmission and reflection probabilities uh, not equal to one, but in this case we are simplifying and uh, everything is this simple. So due to the peculiarities of the uh, one plus one dimensions, uh, so we can consider uh, left moving waves and right moving waves as independent. So I'm going to focus only on left moving waves to make things simpler. And uh, as you may guess, uh, we have freedom. Okay, because the fact that we have an entrance and an exit is not enough to determine the actual trajectory of the of the wave because we have freedom because uh, this incoming wave could come out from this point or from any other point so we need to specify uh, a given rule so given uh, an entrance uh, where do we come out from and so we need to specify this transfer function okay which i call tau okay so I'll note the notation given some initial point here in the in region this x plus in when we reach the entrance the transfer function uh, determines our out coordinate okay so it's quite simple so different uh, and this function can, could be complicated okay it can take any form that you can imagine so we will play with that uh, for a while so what we need to do to understand if the, if the evolution of any quantum state in this space time is affected by the presence of the wormhole, is to build uh, the explicit form of the modes. Okay? And in particular, we will consider if the quantum vacuum defined here uh, in the in region, when propagated through the wormhole, reaches the uh, out region as a vacuum state or as something else okay so this is the key question of particle production quantum particle production problems okay so and if you think a little bit or uh, maybe it's a bit confusing but after thinking a while uh, you will reach to this conclusion that the that the modes which are functions of x plus and x minus can be written in this form i'm not going to explain the details just think about it we have a paper published so if you are interested and uh, as you can see, it's quite simple. This part is simple. Uh, for any value of x minus uh, that is located before reaching the wormhole throat, the entrance, then the wave is just the initial plane wave that we defined in the past. So nothing changes. But once you cross it, uh, you can see that the, the phase of the wave function has changed. Okay, because this piece here that somehow is propagating this one actually comes from another uh, uh, point in the in region okay so when you saw before here that uh, this in particular 
uh, this extension when propagated backwards actually comes from the future okay but when you see you put everything together just to build the modes uh, this is what what you get a combination of uh, the initial x plus in at point one and uh, the uh, outgoing wave is the wave coming from the point two okay and with these elements that now that you have the the, the modes uh, you need to revise the basics of quantum fields in two dimensions and see how the number of particles uh, in one place and in the other are related and all those details so uh, i don't have much time and this slide has a lot of information but essentially I'm, so i'm going to skip many details so essentially i'm quantizing left and right moving modes so we only need to focus on the left and uh, once you uh, obtain the modes, okay, you can define creation and annihilation, creation and annihilation operators, and those operators define your own vacuum. Okay. Now the point is that if you choose different coordinates, uh, you can uh, perform a similar analysis with different uh, creation and annihilation operators, which uh, de define a different vacuum, and then in general. These two back here, uh, these two backward uh, will be different unless there is there are some particular relations between the uh, coordinates, the capital letters and uh, small letters. Okay. So if you want to relate uh, a small and capital letters uh, and a small and, and capital uh, creation and annihilation operators, you need to introduce the power of coefficients, and uh, in, in this way. You can determine the number of particles that the capital observers see in the uh, small letter vacuum. And this is related to the uh, square of the modulus of the beta coefficients. But I'm not going to compute any beta coefficients because they are very complicated in general. So what I do is to play a little bit with these definitions and the integrals involved in the number of particles. This sum is actually an integral. And then we can express this same quantity in terms of the two point functions of the field. Okay, so this is going to simplify our lives a lot. So we don't need to compute any beta coefficients because uh, all the information contained in them is already contained within the two point function, the normal order two point function. Okay. And this is this object is the one I'm going to use. Okay, so essentially uh, the point is that the number of particles is given as an integral over this kernel. And this kernel is uh, represented by the two point function of the scalar field. And uh, these weights are the modes that we use. So essentially, it depends on the detector, the kind of detector that you have. Okay, so there is a part that depends on the field and another part that depends on the type of detector. And this specifies the number of particles that you observe. Okay. And um, Paying attention to this two point function in this particular case of uh, one plus one dimensions with uh, conformal fields, uh, it takes this form, okay, which essentially uh, depends only on the uh, relation between uh, small letters and capital letters. But once you have this change of coordinates, uh, you can determine the two point function, okay, and there are some cases, obvious cases in which there is no particle production, like uh, in, in inertial transformations of coordinates, okay. In this case, the two point function is automatically zero, so the number of particles is invariant. So the same vacuum, the observers with uh, inertial observers share the same vacuum. Uh, constant proper acceleration trajectories also are invariant, so no particles in that case. And uh, also note that the limit, uh, the coincidence limit, when the any near, nearby uh, points uh, in small letters. Uh, are related to nearby points in capital letters, then uh, the coincidence limit is smooth and produces the stress energy tensor. Okay, so the number of particles is somehow related. The main contributions comes from the coincidence points and is due to the energy fluxes. When there is energy flux, then you have particle creation and that gives the main contribution to this integral. Okay, that's the the, the, the most relevant aspect of this uh, representation. Okay. So we don't have two minutes left. Okay, sorry. So anyway, so uh, using these formulas, we can consider different examples like uh, this type of transfer function, 
which is represented here. So the, the, two, the entrance and the exit are together for some time, and then we connect, we separate the exit from the entrance. And this is what the mode C, and the two point function is given by this uh, function, these quantities it can be represented as a function of two points. So it can represent it as, as a surface. So this surface is not zero, so the integral will not be zero. So we will have particle production. That's simple. Okay, how many particles? That depends on the integral. You need to choose the modes and do the integrals, but the key result is that for this type of trajectory, you have particle production and, and energy flux. If you uh, start with the entrance and exit together, separate them and then bring them back together, uh, which is this scenario, we will also have particle production. And as you can see, the process of turning on and uh, of, uh, separating and bringing back together the, the entrance and exit uh, are asymmetric. Okay, so this is an interesting phenomenon to be explored. And uh, in my opinion, the most relevant aspect is the uh, consider what happens if, uh, if we could travel to the past. So can we go back and live uh, uh, an earlier situation? Well, uh, traveling to the past, so like representing this movie, the ground, uh, Groundhog Day, imagine that this is the beginning of the day, end of the day, and then the day repeats again, okay? And this is X, the point three coincides uh, with, the, with the end of the previous day, okay? So, uh, and all this region here is mapped into this region here, okay? So we are living, repeating the day, like in this movie. So in that case, what we see is the transfer functions for two uh, distant points, are going to coincide here, okay? And when they coincide and you have different points, then uh, you are going to have an infinite, a divergence here, okay? Which is not going to be compensated by anything here because these two are nearby, but these two are distant. So you have an infinite energy flux. So whenever you want to go back uh, in time, uh, you are going to find these uh, infinite energy fluxes, which is a uh, quite unphysical situation. And so this is the, the summary. So we presented a simplified model of uh, one hole to explore quantum effects. And we saw that particle production is possible in general. And if you want to travel back in time, uh, you are going to destroy everything. So because there will be infinite uh, divergent energy fluxes. And that's it, thank you. Okay, Gonzalo, thank you very much for your talk. So we have time for one question, if there is any. So if any in the audience wants to to make a question, please raise your hand. Okay, no questions? Okay, so if there are no questions, so Gonzalo again for your talk, and we move to, to the next speaker. And the next speaker, uh, okay, so uh, Professor Alexander Kirillov. Uh, okay. Uh, so Gonzalo, you can drop your video now. Okay, so I invite Alexander to give a... I see. Okay. So can you share your screen? Just a moment. Uh... Okay, so we are seeing your screen right now. Mm -hmm. Something goes wrong, so... Just a moment. Uh, okay. Okay. So well, now we can see your slides. Mm -hmm. You can go to full screen mode for us to better see them. Okay. So our next speaker is Alexander Kirillov, who is going to talk about relic magnetic wormholes and possible sources of toroidal magnetic fields in galaxies. Please, mm -hmm. you can start. Okay. Uh, we, uh, we were going to, to study uh relic magnetic wormholes and uh, to show that uh, and demonstrate that these uh, wormholes may may be sources of toroidal magnetic fields in galaxies okay this uh, our talk is based on two papers our papers published in, uh, last year and you you can find it here just a moment okay uh, 
The basic idea comes uh, to us from observation of ring galaxies. Uh, probably you, you know that uh, many uh, galaxies have ring-like form, and there is two types of uh, mechanism which may produce such ring galaxies. The basic mechanism is uh, scattering, just uh, as shown here. Just a moment. Like um, Maya's object and um, on this slide, I, I, I show the first Hawk object, which has very symmetric form, and um, my else object, and NG, C, and so on. Two basic mechanisms to form such objects is the scattering impact uh, of the scattering of two galaxies. And uh, the idea was that uh, some of the galaxies have very ideal form, ring form, and uh, they look like stable uh, torus-like wormhole. First, I recall how um, different wormholes can, uh, can be uh, produced. Uh, here I show the slide with a uh, uh, which demonstrates that uh, topology in uh, general relativity is not fixed, is fixed by onset. So it's, uh, we can fix topology by onset, and uh, there is Gerich theorem, which uh, shows that topology do, do not change without quantum gravity, of course. And uh, um, classification of different wormholes can be found like this. So I presented here uh, Higor's diagrams and how to produce, uh, to, to generate any wormhole as solutions of general relativity is very simple. You may take surfaces, uh, genus, uh, an arbitrary genus, and glue such two surfaces in the space and to, to obtain a wormhole. In general, uh, this doesn't mean that a wormhole will be a thin shell or another kind of shell. For illustration, I uh, suggest uh, on the picture uh, genus zero wormhole, spherical symmetric wormhole. This wormhole is not so good because it uh, requires either exotic matter or modification of general relativity. And uh, without this uh, modification of exotic matter, this wormhole is uh, unstable and collapses very, very quickly. This was shown uh, many years ago, 50 years ago, approximately, and uh, repeated by Lobo, for example, and many other papers. The simplest stable wormhole can be obtained uh, like a torus -like wormhole, genus one wormhole. So we have two torus and glue uh, surfaces by this torus. This uh, wormhole can be a bit uh, stable because uh, if you consider an uh, uh, open model, uh, Lobachevsky space, for example, and do such gluing on Lobachevsky space, then this wormhole will expand uh, together with all the space and uh, is stable indeed. This was shown in our papers. And as an illustration, I show how we can uh, glue uh, wormholes on Lobachevsky space without any exotic matter in a more general way. In more general way, we may use a uh, geodesics line, glue along these lines on, uh, glue along this geodesics, obtain this kind of figure, this is one geodesic grid, and glue uh, uh, along a red of lines to geodesics. And we obtain this kind of wormhole, so this will be a uh, negative curvature space, constant negative curvature space um, with wormhole on it. This is all, already not Lachevsky space, it's more general space. And as illustration of uh, wormhole in three dimensions, we uh, may rotate, run, use uh, axial symmetry and rotate these uh, wormholes and obtain torus-like wormholes. This uh, is possible to do and um, 
what is important that uh, in uh, flat space, our space, of course, is flat, and the flat space torus like wormholes uh, are not stable. They also collapse, but uh, up to now, we don't know how fast, uh, how rapidly they collapse. Only particular some results we have due to Bronikov and his colleagues that uh, if uh, this kind of wormhole has uh, one of radius very big, so is cylindrical wormhole and cylindrical wormhole can be without exotic matter and be stable. This was shown by Bronikov and his colleagues. Uh, sorry. As illustration, uh, before proceed further, I have to say that the most simple way to construct a wormhole in Lobachevsky space is simply to use some kind of uh, factorization. So if you factorize a space over a discrete subgroup of group of motions, then we obtain uh, exactly a stable wormhole in uh, Lobachevsky or constant negative Sikovich space. And, uh, Upon this, uh, we may deform metric and obtain uh, flat space. But uh, just here to illustrate how uh, wormholes will be seen on sky in flat space or in uh, negative curvature space. This is throat of wormhole and how it will look on a flat space. I repeat again that this wormhole on negative curvature space is stable. It expands together with uh, all space, this uh, scale factor. While this uh, wormhole is not stable, is uh, collapses, but uh, the rate of collapse is not clear yet. It's a very difficult problem to, to uh, construct and solve this uh, kind of symmetry, uh, wormhole of this kind of symmetry. And uh, we uh, did not succeed to, to produce more rigorous result for flat space. Nevertheless, if we have wormhole, uh, this wormhole may possess a magnetic field. Magnetic field, uh, these uh, uh, equations for the magnetic field uh, for uh, any metric, this uh, equations works for any metric, for any background, and they reduce to this kind of two equations for uh, empty space. If we construct this uh, solution, to, I, I mean, if we construct solutions uh, due to non-trivial topology, magnetic field may be non-trivial, and uh, examples are known, for example, for spherical symmetric wormhole, for example, we may uh, consider paper Bronikov, Perde, as, as far as I remember, and uh, submit a charge, a charge to the throat, and to obtain a dipole field. field. Uh, this is non-trivial solution on, on with, uh, for magnetic field, comes out from non-trivial topology, of course. If we consider more general non-spherical symmetric wormhole, but um, uh, ring type wormhole, torus-like wormhole, we have two class of different solutions. Uh, we may insert magnetic field, uh, dipole magnetic field here, monopole, I, I will say monopole magnetic field, this kind uh, of solution. Here I demonstrate uh, lines of strength for magnetic field. And here is magnetic charge. And another kind of solution exists when we insert into our wormhole uh, fictitious current, then uh, magnetic field may have this kind of solution. This is steroidal field. Both Sorry, fields... Alexander, uh, two minutes left. Mm -hmm. so okay. And different effects of uh, these wormholes. The first simplest effect. Uh, some collective effects we can see the elsewhere, but here we should to, to stress that there are two important effects. First effect is accelerate the, uh, that wormhole may work as accelerator of charged particles. For example, here is this illustration. If you have active galactic nuclei with wind, then uh, this construction with magnetic field will accelerate particles. We capture particles and um, accelerate them. 
And another important fact that if you have toroidal magnetic field and toroidal wormhole, then such wormhole uh, collects and um, collects a clump of baryonic matter, and we did some uh, estimates here. First estimate that before recombination, if uh, big radius of uh, toroidal magnetic uh, wormhole uh, is uh, has the order one megaparsec, then uh, fluctuations. So, so uh, it uh, collects baryons from nearby region, and uh, it may uh, produce very, very big clump, which uh, can produce galaxies. If uh, radius is smaller, then this is not. Uh, it's for smaller, uh, they collapse before recombinations. So, the, uh, roughly speaking, <coughs> if wormhole collapses. It may produce uh, some kind of magnetic black hole in the center, and uh, magnetic lines may be, uh, may, be uh, may produce magnetic field, toroidal magnetic field in galaxies in this way. And the second, if uh, if radius larger than one megaparsec, then it expands, and uh, in the galaxy we have almost constant magnetic field. So this is uh, possible to to. Uh, consider this effects for magnetic fields. And as a overview, I would like to, uh, to stress that objects like uh, stable magnetic wormholes may exist and may have torus-like forms. Magnetic holes lead to new phenomena. They may work ex accelerator of charged particles or form some uh, ring-type structures, in particular some unexpected Circular radio objects were observed. Uh, this is one possible candidate was published uh, recently. And probably one more important uh, observational feature is that uh, probably everybody knows that uh, in, in observations we found some galaxies without deck matter. Without deck matter, uh, galaxies also may be formed by. Uh, ring type uh, wormholes, magnetic wormholes, of course. Thank you for the attention. And any question? Thanks for your talk, Alexander. So, are there any questions in the audience? If you have any questions, you can raise your hand or unmute your microphone to talk. Hola. Yes. Yeah, please speak. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Griselda, are you? Uh, yes. Yeah. You want to make any question? Uh, no, sorry, sorry. Ah, okay. Okay, yeah, we are still on the questions time. So, okay. So, if there are no questions, so we thank Alexander again for his talk, and then and so we move to our next speaker. Okay, so Griselda, going to invite you. Okay, so you should be able to share your. Share your video to the screen, so mm -hmm. okay. Can you do it? Yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah, we are seeing your screen right now. So if you go to the slides, okay. So now we see your slides, we can hear you. Okay, so our next speaker is Griselda Figueroa Aguirre, who is going to talk about circularly symmetric thin cell wormholes in FFR gravity with two plus one dimension. You can start. Uh, we cannot hear you now. I'm sorry, the sound is. Okay. Hello, okay. hello. Yeah, we no? can hear you. Yeah. Yeah, this, your sound is on. You can start. Sure. Wormholes in FL gravity with um, uh, three dimensions. The talk is going to explain briefly the motivations of FL gravity, the junction conditions in general relativity, and we are going to work with in, in the construction of these wormholes uh, and the construction and stability of the wormholes in FL gravity, followed by the conclusions. The, the motivations um, are um, is 
if our gravity is motivated uh, by fundamental uh, problems in cosmology like uh, early time inflation, late time cosmic accelerated expansion, dark matter, uh, quantum gravity. Uh, FR gravity is one of the simplest modifications to general relativity in which we replace the um, color curvature by a function of it in the uh, in Hilbert action. The field equations take this form uh, in the metric formalism. Junction conditions in general relativity is a formalism that allows us to match different solutions across any per surface under certain conditions. It is useful to model uh, thin layers of matter, rainbow cosmologies, simple one horse geometries, etc. We uh, work with two different manifolds that we paste on a, on a shell in order to obtain a new manifold. Uh, the first fundamental form can be calculated in this way. We work with So, Griselda, uh, we cannot hear you. The sound went off. So, can you hear me? Uh, Griselda, we are not listening to you. Uh, Griselda, can you hear me? So, Griselda, we cannot hear you. I listen. Griselda. Sorry, Griselda, can you hear us? We are not listening to you. Yeah, Griselda, we cannot hear you. Okay, let me let me stop you to see if okay. Okay. So Griselda. Griselda, we cannot hear you. Griselda, sorry, we cannot hear you. So Griselda, I don't know if you are hearing us. I'm also writing to you. We cannot hear you. But it seems that you, you are not hearing us as well. Uh, sorry to all the, the audience, but uh, it seems we cannot uh, communicate with her uh, because I'm trying different ways to, to talk to her, but it seems that she is not listening to us with any problem. Uh, so she's continuing. <laughs> her told us is nothing happened, so, so I'm trying to uh, email her. And so, uh, sorry, Diego, what we can yeah. do probably is just try to follow her, yeah. her reasoning with the cursor. Yeah. Well, we can't yeah, hear her, but at least we can read what she is trying to uh, indicate, because okay. she has uh, she has about uh, fifteen pages, and she's almost uh, at the end. Okay. So what we can okay. try and do is just follow. Yeah, follow she's so I, I have been writing to her, but she's so focused yeah. on the talk that she's not really. Right. Okay. Right. So let's do it that way. Thanks, Diego. So it's almost like a uh, Charlie Chaplin silent movie.
Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, it seems that the host cannot reactivate the sound by, from, from here. So it has to be, I can invite her to, to reactivate it, but I cannot do it on my own unless she see my message, which uh, is something that's not happening. Well, she's, she's almost finished. I think uh, just one more slide. But I guess one, one can follow her, her reasoning, right? So it was the disability regions, you know, she uh, tried to linearize the, the, the region, the solutions around some, some specific set, uh, space time. Now for some specific F of R uh, models, and he has the conclusions. So what we can do is, is read the, the conclusions. I can't read the conclusions. Do you hear me? I'm Let's try it. I mean, uh, you are one, of, one of the co-authors yeah, of can this article. Okay. We can read it. We can read it. Uh, that's fine, uh, Ernesto. Thank you very much. We, we have constructed a family of circular symmetric one holes in two plus one dimensional sphere of gravity with constant scalar curvature to air. We have studied their stability and the perturbation preserving the symmetry. Uh, presented two examples symmetric one holes across the throat with the same constant scalar curvature at the both sides and asymmetric one hole with different curvature scalar in quadratic affair. The Jackson conditions in F of gravity are more demanded than in general relativity, so the equation is of state is forced to be this one uh, for a general affair theory and this for quadratic affair. In both cases, we have found solution with normal matter uh, with a C a negative zeta. So the present and what field is always required in our construction. Well, <laughs> thank you. Uh, if you have any questions, okay. I will try to, to answer them because Griselda. Uh, okay, Ernesto, it, thank you. Thank you very much for jumping in to, to help us. <laughs> yes. Griselda, can you hear me? No, it seems the problem is still there. So Griselda, if you can hear me, so we have been unable to, to follow you because your sound was went off at some point and, and we just we were following the, the slides. I don't know if you have any way of, because uh, it seems that your, your microphone is on, but we are not listening to anything. Okay, so anyway, if, um, uh, if anyone in the audience has any question, maybe Ernesto can reply to them since we have a couple of minutes left. Okay. Okay, so since the technical problem is still there, so, so we can conclude the talk. Let's uh, thank the speaker for her presentation while we, we follow the, the slides. Yeah, okay, it doesn't matter. Uh, so, so we can move to the to the last uh, to the to the last speaker of the session. Um, so I now need to uh, okay. She has to she has to end share your screen. Yeah, maybe I can do it. Um, um let me see there any option to do this. Yeah, I, I can't so find the here. okay, uh, yeah, okay. So I'll okay, yeah, here we down, are. Down. Right. okay. So Ismael, are you there? Uh, I think so, yeah, here, let me invite yes, you. Yeah. Okay, let us try, uh, try to share your screen with us. Okay. Okay, the button down the screen. I'm sharing the screen. Um, maybe you need to switch, uh, log off and log in again because uh, for those of some speakers need to drop from the from the Zoom and enter again in order to be able to do this. So I don't know if this is your case. Mm, I don't know. Let me let me check this. Ismail, where okay. is uh, I think share screen. Yeah. 
Right. You see my screen? Yeah, we are seeing your screen and we are listening to you well. So, uh, okay. So our last speaker of the day, of the session is Ismail Ayuso, who is going to talk about Warhol geometries induced by action dependent uh, uh, Lagrangian theories. So you can start. Okay. Hey, everybody. First of all, thanks to the organizer for the opportunity to show my current work, especially under this difficult situation. My name is Ismail Ayuso. I am a PhD student at Lisbon University, and here I'm going to speak about one of my last work with the title of Warhol Geometries Induced by Action Dependent Lagrangian Theory, based on this paper, which is a collaboration with Francisco Lobo and Jose Pedro, and Jose Pedro Mimoso. Well, of course, you know that general relativity is the current theory of gravity, so I'm not going to stop at this point, but let me remind that Warhol solution is a possible solution of this theory of gravity. So the first question will be, what is a Warhol? What is a Warhol? A Warhol can be considered as a tunnel from one point of space-time to another one, connected by a throat, obviously. If, if this Warhol is possible to be transversable by by an observer, we will call this as a traversable workhorse. But some properties has to, has to be satisfied in order to, to have this traversable workhorse. For example, an horizon is not permitted. The tidal gravitational force should be minimal in order to eliminate the spaghettization effect. It should be possible to cross the workhorse in a finite and reasonable small time because imagine you have a workhorse solution, but you need more than the human life in, cross the, in crossing this. At the end of the day, you don't have an effective workhorse, uh, an effective traversable workhorse. The workhorse should be possible to boil in this universe. Uh, imagine once again, you have a, a, a mathematical solution, but it needs more energy that, or all the energy of the universe. You have a mathematical solution, okay, but you don't have a real solution for our universe and the solution must be perturbatively stable. In this case, let me consider this specific metric, which is spherically symmetric and static, and, static, and we will use the basal coordinate. It's important to remark this radial function, which should possess a global positive minimum at the Warhol throw. This is translated into the flaring out condition, which are these ones. It means the first derivative has to be zero in order to have a minimum, and the second derivative has to be positive at the minimum. It has to be uh, positive to have a minimum, because in the other case, we will, we will have a maximum. In addition, we can set this minimum at u equal to zero without loss of uh, loss of generality. The problem here is that in general relativity, when we, when we study this kind of solution, when we study wormhole solution, we find that this uh, should be support, supported by exotic matter. They will be supported by energy matter, which violates the new energy condition. This is the reason because it's important to study if this phenomenon occurs as well in uh, other theories of gravity, in modified gravity theories. In this case, and in this talk, we are going to speak about this specific modified, modified gravity theory, which was proposed by Matthews Lasso in this very interesting paper. In this case, we have the einstein hilbert axiom, okay, as usual, the general relativity part, which is extended with the additional dissipative term, which is this one. In this case, we have a, a background for vector, which essentially plays the role of a cosmological constant, but the cosmological constant is a scalar. In this case, we have a, a background for vector, and the vector field S, which is an action density field, which supports the dependence of the action into the Lagrangian. It means that at the end of the day, we have an action which depends on the Lagrangian as usual, but, but this Lagrangian depends on the action as well. And this is the, the novel part. 
Of course, and as usual, after calculations, we can obtain the uh, tensorial equation of motion, which are these ones. You can, you can see that we obtain the usual term associated with general relativity. These are the uh, Einstein tensor and the energy momentum tensor plus a new geometrical term, which is defined at which is defining here. Obviously, if we impose that lambda, the, for, the four component of, of the four vector finite, we, we, uh, to finite, we will recover general relativity. So at this point, we have a modified gravity theory with uh, the tensorial equation of motion, and we have this previous metric. So now, we are going to show, uh, or I'm going to show you the component of the of this new geometrical part for this specific metric, which are this. Of course, you know that the non-diagonal terms of general relativity uh, are zero, so we have to impose that the non-diagonal terms of this new geometrical part finite. Two. This is the reason because we have to impose that these two components has to be has to be zero, and consequently we have to impose these two components of the four vector or of the background four vector to be zero. On the other hand, by symmetry and because the metric only depends on on. On the, comp on, on the parameter u, we have to impose that this diagonal term to be only a, or only a function of u. And consequently, at the end of the day, we will, uh, we will have to impose that this component of lambda to be proportional to this one in order to have here a function of, of u. And finally, from this other non-diagonal component, which has to be zero as well, we will have these two new constraints. So at the end of the day and summarizing, we will have this form for the background, for the, uh, for the background for vector and this form for the metric. Let me remark that here in the, in, in the, in the, in the background vector, we only have this degree of freedom, which is a function of u, okay, in the third component of the of the vector. So now let me take a specific energy momentum tensor in order to solve uh, the scalar equation of the theory. This is the case for the three components and we can see that from the from, from the flaring out, out condition in which the second derivative of the uh, of the radial function at the throat has to be positive, we will obtain the conclusion that this sum, this is the energy, the, the, the energy density with the radial pressure of the workhorse, we will obtain that this has to be. Uh, negative and consequently this is the violation of the new energy condition. But anyway, let me study other example. Uh, here uh, we are going to consider this radial function and this other function for the rest of the metric and at the end of the day we will have this for, for the metric. As in the previous, we will impose the flaring out condition and we will recover the ellis bronikov solution, a space time for a workhorse. Here I wanted to show you the, the profile of the energy density and the radial pressure for different uh, choices of the po uh, for different choices of the function lambda, all of them are power law choices, but the, the main conclusion here is that 
we, we, uh, we obtain Richard geometrical structure for, for that, that in general relativity, let me say that general relativity is the case with the blue line. The other one uh, uh, are the cases in which this new phenomenology is on. But the other, the other important conclusion is that when we sum the energy density with a radial pressure, pressure we will obtain a, a equation, a definition, which, no, uh, which doesn't depend on, the, or on lambda, which is the new contribution. Uh, which is the new contribution. And consequently, we will recover only for this sum uh, the same phenomenology that in general relativity. And consequently, if in general relativity, the new energy condition is violated, in this theory, the new energy condition will be violated as well. And everywhere. Ismael, sorry, two minutes left. Okay, thanks. Uh, in this case, we are going to consider other different strategy. In this case, we will impose this energy uh, profile and this radial pressure. We will impose this uh, equation of a state for the fluid and we solve uh, the equation and we obtain the, uh, the function for A and the function for, for lambda. In addition, in this case, we have to impose the Flanders condition. This is, we want a uh, space time yeah, which at the infinity reproduce Mikowski. This gives us this uh, two new constraints, which at the end of the day and with the, uh, the flaring out condition, reproduce once again the new energy violation, uh, the, new, uh, the new energy condition, the violation of this. Uh, Finally, I wanted to show you three more examples very quickly. They are black bound solution. The procedure is very similar. We impose this, uh, this function uh, in the metric and we resolve. We impose the flaring out condition and we impose the, um, the, the flatness of, of the metric at the infinity and we recover that the sum of the energy density with the radial pressure doesn't depend on, on lambda. And consequently, this term is exactly the same term in general relativity where new energy condition is violated. Here you can see the profiles where obviously they are much richer uh, than in general relativity. Let me remind that general relativity is the blue line. This is the first case the second one and the third one. And with this, let me finish with my conclusion, which are that we have explored wormhole geometries in the recently proposed axiom dependent Lagrangian theory. It was shown that they generalize its gravitational field equation essentially depends on the background for vector, this is lambda, that plays the role of a coupling parameter associated with the dependence of the gravitational Lagrangian upon the axiom. In the context of workhole configuration, we have used the basal coordinate, obtaining restriction on the background for vector and on the space time, which are translated into these ones. And uh, we have found a plethora of specific asymptotically flat, symmetric, and asymmetric solution, which power law choices for the function lambda, for instance, by generalizing the Alice Veronikov solution, which was one of the examples. Uh, black bone geometries among other solutions. This compact object possess a far richer geometrical structure than their general, re general relativistic counterpart, but unfortunately, we have not been able to find no violation of the new energy condition for this space time in the proposed action dependent Lagrangian. And this is all. Thank you so much for your attention. And of course, if you have questions, please. Thank you very much, Ismael, for your talk. So, as Ismael was saying, is there any question? So we have uh, some, some minutes to, to this. If anyone wants to discuss something. I have a question. Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, could you please uh, show again your Lagrangian? Yes. Let me...
X. This one. Uh, uh, just to understand how uh, action and Lagrangian have different dimensions. So the difference is volume multiplication by volume at lambda. What is? Sorry, say again. Uh, S. What is S? Is action. Okay. Or yeah. action, uh, action density. So it is also yeah. the dimension yeah. of S is Lagrangian. So you say that it is action, action density. Yes, I mean, it's, just terminology. It's, it's, it's difficult to, to, to explain here because it, it, it can check by the Helgus theorem. And after a lot of calculus, we can check that this, in principle, vector field S. At the end of the day, uh, has the same information that the action. So, in this sense, is a vector field on the one hand, but on the other hand, and at the same time, this is a, an action density, which is related, in addition, with the with the stock theorem. But it is not trivial to see this, of course. Uh, the vector field is an action density. I don't know what, what do you mean by action density? Action or axion? No, action density. Action is the action. In because, yeah. Okay. Uh, action density means that it has the information of the action, but it's not exactly the action. Uh, the action. For example, mm -hmm. the action is a scalar. This is the first difference. Here you have, uh, or we have, a vector field. Obviously, it's not exactly the action. But you can check that the information which is into this vector field is the same information which is into the action. Uh, I don't know if I, I am explaining. OK. Good. I, I just do not understand why you call this action-dependent Lagrangian. It is Action, you add action action, but uh, action dependent Lagrangian. Okay, doesn't matter. This Lagrangian multiplier, I don't know. <laughs> no, no, it's not. It's not a Lagrangian multiplier. Is, I mean, when you, it's difficult to explain here without a, without a background. But um, when, when. When initially you introduced this only the, uh, like a vector field, which is the action at the boundary of the limit of the integrals. And at the end of the day, you can check that by the theorem of stocks, this has to be the action. Okay. But I, I understand it, it, it's not, Easy for me to explain this without a paper to to write, but it's terminological. Mm -hmm. Thank, you. thank you. Okay, so thank you very much. So so it's time to to end the session. So so we can thank all the speakers that uh, have uh, spoken at this uh, session. So thank you to you all. Just to remind you that the uh, next session will be starting tomorrow at half past six. The official schedule of the of the meeting, so I hope to see you there. And for well, for the speakers talking tomorrow, I will we will send a reminder to please send us uh, your slides in case there are uh, any technical problem. That's okay. So the day, so today in the along the day to send us the, the slides. So I don't know if Francisco wants to say something in addition. Thank you, Diego. That, the, that's all. That's been a bit. Uh, a nice session with the observational signatures, um, essentially, while well, the first four or five talks, uh, the state of the arts, uh, bla uh, the, the rings and the shadows, uh, the observational uh, aspects of wormholes, which is which is very nice. Uh, like Diego mentioned, tomorrow is, has a very nice, uh, great session, a mini session on warp drives, the updates, the re recent developments. So um, it promises. I think uh, I'm looking forward to that, that mini session. So see you tomorrow. Okay. See you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. See you tomorrow. Bye.